Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm Peter Mandelson, um, itinerant sort of cabinet member, trade commissioner, and whatever, um, and very pleased to be here this afternoon uh, to chair and moderate uh, this panel. Uh, joining me um, are Stephen Smith, who is the Australian High Commissioner uh, here in London, um, Vice Admiral Paul Madison, uh, who used to command the Canadian Navy, uh, but has had a change, sort of change of late change of career, um, and is now the inaugural director of the University of New South Wales Defence Research Institute. Um, Alesso Patalano, um, who's senior lecturer in war studies. Uh, in the Department of War Studies uh, here at King's. And Nicola, here you are, well done. Nicola uh, Leveringhouse, who's Senior Lecturer at King's College London. Um, where are you joining us from, Nicola? From Germany. Very good. Um, so uh, I suggest that we have a sort of half an hour discussion or thereabouts here and then open it up to uh, questions uh, from you all. And uh, I, think that, I think that the first thing we should do, and I'm going to come to you, Steve, if I may, um, is just to sort of take a step back and look both at the origins of AUKUS and have a discussion about its durability. Um, I mean, it's clearly a very big deal, conceptually, uh, politically, uh, and certainly financially, um, in what is becoming the epicenter of the world's economy uh, and our geopolitics. Um, but I suppose the first question I would put to you, in a sense, Steve, is this. To what extent should we see AUKUS in these sort of um, big power political US versus China um, Indo-Pacific terms, um, or conversely, just a very, very large procurement program uh, uh, by your uh, government. I mean, the final landing place for what has been a very long journey and saga uh, <laughs> of submarine development uh, by successive Australian uh, governments, which you now think has found its final landing place. So how should we see it uh, in those terms, variously? Well, not much in that first question, Peter, so I'll do my best. Probably helps if I start at the notion of the formation of the Indo-Pacific, because historically we refer to the Asia-Pacific. We mm. started, in terms of Australia, started using the phrase Indo-Pacific uh, 2011, 12, and formalised that in our 2013 Defence White Paper, which used the nomenclature Indo-Pacific for the first time in an official Australian document. And that became our strategic framework from that point in time. And that was all about not just the rise of China, but the ongoing importance economically and strategically of the United States, but also the rise of India, the rise of Indonesia, the rise of the ASEAN economies combined, the point that you made generally. So I think the starting point is the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and we did that 2013, 2014, 2015, when we were all still going through the notion of China was becoming deeply successful, raising and taking millions, hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, becoming a responsible member of the international community. And then Xi Jinping and events since then have shown that China is now much more aggressive and assertive. So what is the formation of AUKUS? I think the formation of AUKUS has as its, as its underpinning the notion of integrated defence and deterrence, just as, for example, G7 or Quad might also have that effect in the modern era. But it's, it's, we describe it AUKUS Pillar 1 and AUKUS Pillar 2. Pillar 1 is easy to see. Submarines, as you might put it, a very big capability project. Pillar 2 is advanced technologies, which can, can have either dual use or military capability, hypersonics, autonomous submersibles, artificial intelligence and the like. We describe it um, not as some people do as a as a sort of coalition or a pact or a uh, or or an alliance, but essentially a trilateral technology partnership. Submarines, of course, deeply important, um, and 
we only moved to consideration of nuclear um, uh, powered capability when two things happened. Firstly, we got our conventional uh, submarine fleet back in the water with the help of uh, UK submariners, including John Coles, who did the same job for your nuclear fleet some decades ago. But once we could get our conventional submarine fleet back in the water and operating it at uh, world-class levels, the second thing which changed our capability or our deliberation was, of course, the modernisation of nuclear power for a submarine. And then the Americans, who had only previously, or had previously given only access to the UK, of course, gave it to us, and AUKUS is now what it is. I think, with, I think to make the point about its longevity, um, when you go to Barrow and see the scale of the endeavour, you very quickly realise, firstly, this has enormous strategic and capability implications, but it also has enormous scientific technology, manufacturing, jobs, economy, people mobility implications. And one of the lessons from Barrow, which is told to me every time I speak to a US submarine or a capability person, is that you grow the capability and you grow the capital investment. Once you get to a particular level, you can't fall below that. And so mm. it's got deep long-term depth to it in terms of mm. uh, a project for Australia, 20, 30, 40 years. Uh, and that means, from our perspective, it's here to stay. But it's also here to stay because um, we're now dealing with changed circumstances in the Indo-Pacific, reflected by a more assertive and more aggressive China, which we still want to work with and still want to deal with. And we do want to have everyone agreeing and abiding by the rules of the road, but currently there's some question marks about that in terms of Chinese intentions. And so both a large capability project, which has got uh, industrial and economic implications and future technology in terms of dual use or military capability, all of that makes sense, both from an economic and a security perspective, in the, in, in the Indo-Pacific. Okay, so you're placing equal emphasis on pillars one and two. Mm. Uh, eventually, the SSN AUKUS subs, um, sort of classic but big procurement program, uh, and secondly, pillar two, which is a, a, about a lot else in technology transfer and research and development. Yeah, I, I've been heard to say on a number of occasions, both in Australia and here, my own personal view, capital P personal view, is that if Pillar 2 fails, then AUKUS will fail, and it will default to... Okay, let me just take large, you up on that. A large okay. capability project. Because you're basically saying uh, it's, it, the, the Pillar 1 is worth it as long as there's an enormous amount more to be gained from Pillar 2. Well, Pillar 1 would be worth it as a standalone. So, so, so yes, some, but some it's region. a very, very expensive standalone. Yeah. Well, nuclear submarines are expensive, yeah. as you know from your own cabinet experience. Yeah. And it'll be expensive for, for Australia, expensive for the United States, but well worth it in terms of integrated defence and deterrence. But if you mm. really want to say we have a trilateral partnership about forward-leaning technology, we have to make Pillar 2 a success, which in some respects is a bit more difficult to grip up strategically. Yeah. Submarines, everyone understands that. But when you're dealing with three different jurisdictions, okay. different stage of development for each of the half dozen or so forward-leaning technologies. It, it's, it's, it's I'm, I'm going to come back and test you on Pillar 2, if you don't mind, in a moment. I just want to ask you, though, I mean, I know you're going to say you're completely confident about this, but politically sustainable uh, in Australia, we're talking about a sort of cumulative 40-year program that's got to be sustained at an eventual cost of somewhere between 270 and 370 billion Australian dollars, and that's just by today's reckoning. Mm. We know what happens to budgets. Uh, they usually uh, uh, double. I mean, with those sorts of sums involved, um, an enormous amount can change in politics in 40 years. And Australia, politically, is quite an adversarial place. You probably noticed. <laughs> and you can just imagine when, you know, the, in, at some stage, some politician, some party, locates an electoral advantage in saying, well, shouldn't this go more to spending on the aged or disability support or the health service or schools or whatever, and suddenly 
you find that consensus which exists at the moment in Australia just becoming coming to fracture slightly. Is that not a danger? Well, there are always political risks that one has to manage. But uh, at this point in the cycle, at the start of the AUKUS program and the submarine program, what do we have? We have strong bipartisan support for the program. That's the first thing. Secondly, it was, it was, it was uh, started by a previous Liberal coalition government and now being implemented by an Australian Labor Party government. And there's strong bipartisan support for that. Does it have its naysayers or critics in Australia? Of course it does. We're a thriving, robust democracy. In terms of the adversarial nature of Australian politics, that's probably best exemplified by our question time. From my experience, I find your question time much more fierce, fearsome and adversarial. Really? I thought we were, <laughs> I thought we were tame in comparison no, no, no. to... Oh, it, it scares the hell out of me. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but the, I think to, the big lesson that the Prime Minister, the Deputy Prime Minister, the Minister for Defence Industry have learnt when they come here is if you start this great national endeavour, you cannot stop. And that's also the lesson of your nuclear deterrent submarine program. OK, even as it starts to eat into the destroyer and frigate procurement of the rest of the Australian Navy, as it starts to eat into the Army's procurement, you think, you think that your, your military let alone the public, will be completely consensual and sustainable in their support when this sort of expenditure starts eating into so many different parts of the Australian procurement budget? Well, two things. Firstly, for my sins of the past, which are innumerable, innumerable I was the co-chair of the Defence Strategic Review, yeah. which the government released in April. And that made the point, both in its classified version uh, and unclassified public version, that in the end, more money will need to be spent on defence in our current strategic circumstances, firstly and secondly. There will be choices that we have to make. And there will be some current capability which we have, which down the track we will no longer have. We need to change, for example, our army from a land-based territorial army mm. to a amphibious, capable, literal uh, army, uh, a la US Marines, which also is a responsibility for long-range fires to project power into our northern maritime uh, um, approaches. So will there be changes in capability? Yes. Will there be some things we do now which we can't do in the future? Yes. Will there be resource demands? Yes. But both the previous government and the current government have, also, have both said consistently, we will need in our current strategic circumstances to spend more money on defence. And okay. I was here this morning for your Prime Minister and he essentially said the same thing about the UK and NATO countries generally. Okay. Paul, l let me ask you, because you've commanded a Navy, albeit somebody else's, Canada, um, what is your view on the rationale for AUKUS? I mean, the, the, I mean, the basic calculus of how to create a safe, stable and prosperous Indo-Pacific has clearly uh, changed. Um, I mean, um, now everyone is concerned about how to deter uh, potential China misbehaviour that's going to impinge on the Indo-Pacific's safety and stability and prosperity. From a naval point of view, what's your view about this calculus and about the deterrence rationale for AUKUS? Um, well, thanks for the question. And, and, and before I go there, um, just let me say that um, your original question around, is it procurement or, or is this more strategic? It's definitely more strategic. And it, it's, a, it's a response to messaging out of Beijing, which, which Stephen referred to. And so the belief that we had in the West that the Chinese Communist Party would incrementally democratize on greater exposure to a a free and open global trading system turned out to be a myth, and some would argue that it was a myth that was deliberately um, uh, supported uh, by all elements of the Chinese Communist Party deployed globally. So you're convinced that AUKUS is the answer to this? It is a part of the answer. Mm. And uh, the, 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 the threat settings as they have evolved over the past several years, especially 
after Xi Jinping uncloaked at the 19th Party Congress in 2017 and made it clear mm. that it was his long game objective to replace the United States as the arbiter of um, a post-World War II uh, rules-based um, order as we know it, um, driving um, a value and freedom-based uh, sort of de democratic approach, that, that they see this, you know, they see the U.S. in terminal decline and they see a roadmap to um, sort of shaping how the global design of this century unfolds. Th that caused um, Canberra, uh, which has, enjoys unique geography in the crucible uh, you know, of, uh, of the, in the, in the Indo-Pacific sort of vortex, um, to really begin to ask how can Australia as a, a medium resource, medium power, resource rich, global trading nation of only 25 million or 26 million people secure its vital national interest. And so to double down on the relationship with the United States and other key allies and partners. And, Be and, better than France. Uh, well, France is a, is a key um, partner. There are allies and there are partners. Um, uh, but as this was happening, the United States, I think, ha has realized that things have changed for them as well. And the United States has come to recognize that if they are going to sustain um, a protection of the, of, of the global rules-based order as we know it, that partners and allies need to be um, enabled to, to rise with them okay. to the challenge. I think, and that's what we're on. Okay, I think we've got that. But, you know, y you've had a lot to do with naval procurement mm. uh, in your life. Mm. I suppose the question is, is this not such a, an absolutely colossal commitment? It is. That risks gobbling up the rest of the procurement program, not just of the Navy, but the rest of the Australian military. Well, the, the um, so the, G, the, the GDP... I mean, re remember at the time, Malcolm Turnbull, pro former Prime Minister, was rather sceptical mm. about AUKUS, mm. saying, look, this is, this is too much. <coughs> too yeah. much. Yeah. Um, Stephen would be better. There's, there's going to be a massive advanced. opportunity yeah. cost, yeah. in his view, in committing such resource to this program. Yeah. Um, so the, the Royal Australian Navy has identified a requirement for a nuclear propelled submarine capability for decades and has, has been in this conversation with the UK and with the US um, periodically mm. over time. But I think the, the change in the strategic settings created that opening uh, for, for the US and the UK to have that conversation with, with, with Australia and, and, and to drive on a commitment okay. to transfer that capability. Let me just step on from Australia and go elsewhere in the Indo-Pacific. Alessio, if I may ask you this, because I'm going to come and ask uh, Nicola, if I may, about China in a moment mm. uh, and China's response to all this. I mean, in your knowledge of the region as a whole, would you say that there is buy-in from um, military opinion and military interests in other countries elsewhere in the uh, Indo-Pacific, or is there more? Uh, is that more nuance? Is there greater scepticism? I think, of course, the, the, the depend, it depends on who you're asking the question. Um, but let me take a half a step back because I think what has been missing from this conversation is. An important point that is the point that allows a broader support for AUKUS across the region. And that is, you know, the Indo-Pacific, and, and Simon was absolutely right to, to emphasize the fact that now, instead of Asia-Pacific, East Asia, or whatnot, we call it Indo-Pacific. It's because at the heart, it's a maritime-centric regional space. Uh, the driving, beating heart of prosperity, it's not trains or highways, it is shipping, it is undersea cables. Mm. This is at the very heart of what makes this region one of the most dynamic economically and one with the greatest potential moving ahead. Mm. And this is something that we need really to keep at the back of our mind when we think about AUKUS, because it means also that any significant potential challenge to the stability of that maritime order, which on an average day is pretty safe, 
but it revolves around some small bottlenecks whereby both cables and shipping becomes extremely vulnerable. Mm. And we've seen um, over the last half a decade or so, certainly 2015 onwards, significant change to the operational stability of that theatre, which in turn changed the calculation in Australia about a strategic warning time, as it is known um, in, in Australia, and pushed this question, which has always been there about nuclear subs, from being a conversation with partners and allies to well, we really need to think about this. So that's an important point because um, it underwrites when you have a behaviour and territorial maritime disputes to begin with have been very much symptomatic. If behaviour is a measure or as an indicator of intent, it tells us something about Chinese ambitions that in turn um, it changes how you're looking at that theatre. And in particular, when it comes to maritime and territorial disputes in the South China Sea, whereby with the artificial military installations, you have an extension of your capacity to project military power well beyond the national shores across the entire region, then for a country like Australia, and indeed for any other stakeholder, this is not just about Australia. This is about the stability of the maritime order as a whole. Um, the links that exist in terms of trade, um, uh, um, um, economy, um, and you know, industrial scales that links in the Pacific to the rest of the world, including the Gulf as well as Europe, is absolutely essential. So this is not just a question like, you know, it's an Australian problem. No, 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 no. It's also a European problem. It's a British problem. We all need to be paying attention to the fact that we live in a maritime century, and if there are risks in critical places of passage to that order, then we need to be thinking about it. So that's where you have countries like Japan, South Korea, India, um, both bilaterally as well as through other multilateral means, whether it is the quads when it comes to Australia, Japan, uh, the United States or India, or indeed when it comes to other trilateral tech minilaterals like GCAP that links together Italy, Japan um, and the UK, you have a fundamental understanding that AUKUS is coming about as one of the pieces of a security architecture in which key uh, advanced capabilities will give you that strategic edge in order to continue to maintain some degree of balance. But you're saying that we're creating strategic edge in a way that doesn't only secure the Indo-Pacific region. You're saying that that knocks on to other parts of the world so that when some in Britain, for example, some in the British Labour Party, which supports AUKUS, by the way, uh, nonetheless have said, look, if there's a Labour government coming to office in this country, we're going to have to make our primary focus on the Euro-Atlantic area rather than the Indo-Pacific. Your riposte to that would be you can't actually separate these areas into such neat uh, geographical zones that one, one, one region's strategic edge is another, uh, is another region's advantage as well. 100%, also because the, the key sort of, there's, there's, there's three points to make about this, and this is a very important point. Um, there's three aspects to this. Number one, what we are looking at, and unfortunately we don't have my usual very weird map of the world that, that basically shows you that m the core challenges and revisionist powers to the international order, they all cluster together in that Eurasian space, which basically brings about to everybody else a potential for manoeuvre and the capacity to exercise pressure, not just directly one-on-one, but also indirectly. That's where this indivisibility of the Euro-Atlantic Indo-Pacific space comes together. That's the first point to make. You have to think about the ocean as a big connecting fabric, a glue that brings prosperity together, and because that prosperity underlies everybody's economy, then it becomes also a place where you exercise pressure. But specifically to the point about the UK and the prioritization, um, You've got two elements to think about. One is if technology, if we agree that technologies and advanced capabilities are a key element of part of how you build some sort of strategic advantage in the future, then surely working with close partners and allies unlocks access to ideas, innovation. Instead of thinking about your own creativity, it's me, Paul, Stephen getting together metaphorically. Your contribution will be bigger than mine, by the way. But, but, but the point is, it, it, it really unleashes sort of access to much greater potential. Well, you're, you're uh, hence 
pillar two, which I think right. is, uh, uh, is very important. Let, let me, Nicola, if I may, can I come to you and ask you about China? Um, how does AUKUS look uh, from China's uh, point of view? Would you say they are indifferent or are they uh, worried? I mean, are they brushing it aside or taking it seriously? They're taking it seriously. Um, you know, I think a lot of commentary has focused on the sort of diplomatic reaction, which has been obviously quite critical, uh, and a lot of Chinese interpretation of particularly the US agenda. Um, I think a lot of that overshadows what are potentially serious military implications for China. And even if AUKUS is a trilateral technology partnership, as opposed to a defence arrangement, it does add a new layer of deterrence against China. Yeah. And there, there are a number of new layers of deterrence against China in Asia today that didn't exist yeah. some five to ten years ago. Um, some of these are sort of trilateral arrangements, millilaterals. Some of these are individual countries like Japan changing their own defence postures and, and the way they look at issues like Taiwan, for instance. So, in essence, I think AUKUS is a serious military concern. It complicates mm. China's room for strategic maneuverability across that geographical space, which is very big, the Indo-Pacific, right? It, 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 it involves the Pacific, um, the Indian, and all the other different seas therein. It complicates the diplomatic and political reach that China has very carefully and at very senior high levels that most Western governments actually don't engage in, really tried to cultivate in the last 10 years um, with its partners, particularly in the Pacific Islands, for instance, but also with ASEAN states. So it complicates that for China. And China has been, as I say, focusing a lot of effort on that area. And then there's the deepening, right? There's the military to military, science to science, mm. intelligence to intelligence mm. relationships that are already happening, right? Mm. If we just forget about pillar two and pillar one at the moment, those relationships, that's what worries um, China, because China knows the value of those exchanges, right? It's had similar exchanges, for instance, in the 1990s, it had them with the United States, uh, scientists on the, in the nuclear sphere, and they ended. And now it's having them with Russia. So it values those kind of things, right? And so, so, so those are the things that, that, that are hurting China, I think. So what you're saying is that you know, the eventual SSN AUKUS subs, when they come on stream, will not necessarily in themselves be game changers. But when you add everything else potentially coming in uh, via pillar two, then this really does begin potentially uh, to change the balance uh, uh, between us and China. Is that what you're saying? That's right, that's right. So earlier it said pillar two has to be a success. Exactly. I mean, this is China's, this is China's way of measuring it, right? If, mm. if pillar two is, is the big threat, not pillar one for China, right? So pillar two, you know, cooperation, hypersonic, cyber, AI, underwater tech, what China really worries about is that it could get expanded, it could include Australia and Japan working together more closely, because China, in China's mind, there are three big military problems for China. The first of these has always been Taiwan, right? It's primary strategic problem. But another one could be a border war over India and a third one, for instance, in the South China Sea. And in all those different scenarios, pillar two tech matters hugely for how mm. China can win and fight wars. It cannot recreate the naval partners that the United States is developing, right? It cannot magic up an Australian or Indian Navy from its relationship with North Korea and Pakistan, right? What it can do, though, is it can focus on those pillar two technologies and have dominance in that area. And this is where AUKUS comes in, because if, if AUKUS threatens that pillar two dominance in that tech, that's very problematic for China. OK, let's come back to this, because the United States doesn't you know, necessarily have an exemplary record in the ease of transfer uh, of technology. So let's come back uh, on that. Steve, can I ask you a question, though, first, about the capacity of the United States uh, to, uh, to deliver? Just staying with um, uh, Pillar 1 for, for a moment. The replacement of existing subs with US Virginia class subs 
then of course eventually with the AUKUS SSNs. I mean, are we sure that the US has the production capacity to make this delivery whilst meeting its own production and procurement needs at the same time? Because I think some people have raised a question about this. I think the, one, of the, one of the reasons AUKUS has been successful and so strongly supported by US, UK and Australia is it, is it in the end it gives you an additional production line? That's the whole point. If we were simply relying upon UK production line and US production lines, then there may not be enough capacity uh, for additional submarine, nuclear submarines to be, to be produced for Australian utility. So one of the key advantages of where we've landed with, the, with AUKUS-1, the so-called optimum pathway, is that we do end up with greater capability. And as we grow Australia's capability to actually build submarines, not the nuclear modular power system itself, but to, to, to build those submarines, we will grow a capability over a period of three decades where we'll be making a contribution and an input to either a UK line or a US mm. line. So we're confident that that will hold. Certainly there's no diminution in either the UK or the US of the commitment and desire and need to continue to produce nuclear powered submarines. Just a very quick point on why have we moved from conventional to, to, nuclear. to nuclear? Well, it's because in the end of changed strategic circumstance. For mm. a long time, Australia worked off the basis, as Alessio referred to, of a 10 year warning time, mm. and that the, the risk that we faced or the threat that we faced was a low to medium level threat from a regional partner. And as long as we had a inverted commas capability edge, we would be fine. In changed strategic circumstances, where you see the rise of a great power uh, pro pro providing strategic competition to the United States, then you have to say, OK, change strategic circumstances, maybe we need a change underwater capability. And the big deficiency with conventional submarines in the modern era is that at some point in the cycle, you have to come up to the surface and snort. And these days, that is much easier to detect than it was 10, 20 years ago. So a combination of changing technological capacity, particularly surveillance mm. from satellite or space or generally, is one of the reasons why we've been, we've come to the strategic conclusion that this is a capability that we need. And in various ways, Alessio and Nicola have, have reinforced that technology point, which I think is right. And in the technology that you need, um, when the US and the UK supply uh, nuclear propulsion technologies, are these going to be black boxed or are they going to be fully transferred to Australia to, for Australia to build out from uh, and to use independently? Well, the first, one, one of the first things that we have to do is to prove our capacity for nuclear stewardship and that's a long haul process uh, and that requires lots of investment, lots of skills, lots of training. At this point in the cycle, we have no ambition to want to, inverted commas, build our own nuclear powered module. We're entirely happy to allow, to allow that to occur via the United States as it occurs with the United Kingdom. So that will be modularised and, sort of, and fitted in. And I've seen the inverted commas fitting in at Barrow. So it's a highly technical, but nonetheless to date, very successful process. So we don't have a civil nuclear industry, which we would need to take us down okay. that step. So we're envisaging this as we, we, we end up doing the build, but build around the module. And the US famously places pretty tough export restrictions uh, on transferring technology to its partners. Are those laws going to remain in place in, the case, in, in respect well, of workers? One, one of the things which is no surprise and no secret to anyone is that in the context of pillar two, so well, firstly, for Pillar 1 submarines, there is a, a, a transfer of technology agreement. Obviously, otherwise, it wouldn't be occurring. Secondly, in terms of AUKUS Pillar 2, we're working very hard with the US to essentially say we need to have that technology transfer arrangements as well. Now, for example, Canada, Paul's, where Paul was Chief of Navy, does have a range of exemptions and exceptions uh, as the United States' nearest neighbour. And you would there expect the same? Well, we expect that there will be seamless technology transfer from the United States to the United Kingdom, from the United Kingdom to Australia, and from Australia, from the US and the UK respectively, to make AUKUS II, the advanced technologies, work. You know, if it's to be a genuine trilateral technology partnership which has success, both in outcomes for potential military capability, 
but also for dual use and civilian capability, there needs to be that seamlessness of technology and that's one of the things we're working very hard on and one of the things that we think we're making progress on. Paul, is this something that would concern you from your experience or not? Yes, um, but I think it's being addressed, or it, mm. it's at least recognised. Look, the, 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 the pillar two technologies or capabilities that we in the West have identified that the Chinese are developing peer or potentially overmatch capability. And this is not, this is strategically uncomfortable. So, so the, the aim around AUKUS Pillar 2, I think, is that we have three powers that sit at the bullseye of strategic trust, coming together in recognition that there is a, that the sort of the 20th century legacy approach to collaboration and acquisition and procurement is no longer fit for purpose. Mm. And that there is a need to accelerate a more seamless and trust-based collaboration that delivers at pace um, a competitive advantage capability in these areas for the all-domain warfighter, driving towards it from interoperability to interchangeability. And what is the, and what is the most obvious systemic, cultural, regulatory impediment? It's, it's ITAR. Mm. And, and so um, for Pillar 2 to be successful, uh, the, the, the U.S. needs to, and, and we're, seeing, we're seeing movement in, in Washington, and, and, um, and London and Canberra are offering um, all sorts of constructive advice around how, how to move this forward. But um, in order for Pillar 2 to be successful, in order for us to deliver that competitive advantage, new generation of warfighting capability in this decade, um, w w the U.S. will need to reform ITAR. And, and at the end of the day, if... If a missile flies over Taiwan, um, I, I think the first thing that'll happen is if ITAR is still a, an impediment, it, it will be moved aside because then we, we truly will be at action stations. Whereas today we talk about urgency, we talk about strategic urgency, we talk about the need to accelerate, we talk about uh, warning time having evaporated and the, and the need to move now as a, in Australia, the whole of nation mm -hmm approach that, that Stephen baked into the D Defense Strategic Review, but we're still not quite there in terms of accepting it across our nations as um, a need in this decade to be moving forward together at campaign planning okay, speed. Okay, well then let me, out, and I'm going to come in a moment, i just give you a two minute warning uh, for questions that anyone wants to put uh, to the panel, so the microphone is coming to you shortly wherever you are. Um, let me ask lastly then to you, Alessio, and if I may also to Nicola. I mean, in 20 or 30 years' time, just look ahead, if you will. If AUKUS flourishes, pillar one, pillar two, in the way that we have uh, discussed, if AUKUS flourishes, what might the security architecture of the Indo-Pacific look like over that length of time frame? So it's always interesting to ask this question because if you think about SS and AUKUS, um, a lot of the sensors that will be on the boat haven't been invented. We don't even know what they will look like, right? Because it's a boat that is going to come out on, on, off the line in 25, 30 years, and then it needs to stay around for another 50. So, so, so that's an interesting sort of thing to put things in context. However, on the other hand, we do know and both Stephen and Paul have been very eloquent about this, that for AUKUS to flourish, the software at the government level, at the industry level, at the military level, at the people-to-people -people level will need to be in place. And that is a guarantee if you want a success. It's an enormous down payment into the long-term success because you need to remove um, constrictive and, and, and restrictive legal frameworks. You have to create a workforce, and it will be an AUKUS generation workforce, right? There's going to be people that are going to be moving around. It's uh, going to be a pretty specialised and trained up workforce but and a crew, by the way. One hundred percent. But let's broaden that out because, because at the same time, from a UK perspective, you've got also GCAP, the uh, Global um, Combat Air Program, with Japan and Italy, which invites a similar consideration. So. When we talk You're confident that that's going to go ahead, are you? Yes, 
in part because a lot of the moving parts for the next generation fighter jets are already in terms of research and development in place. So that actually is going to be theoretically delivered on a slightly shorter time scale than okay. AUKUS's. But the key point about all of this is that once you reach the level of trust and political and industrial integration that is required for these programs to succeed, of course the security architecture is going to be different because the type of conversation that you will have in the working groups, whether it is uh, quads, whether it is any one of the minilaterals or on the margins of other broader gatherings, whether it is ASEAN Regional Forum, ADMM Plus, these specific components will see the actors in them and those who may join it because we haven't talked a lot about the fact that Pillar 2, it's an open architecture proposition. Other countries can join. You know, Japan has been very interesting in the conversation about some of the hypersonics elements. And if you look at the Hiroshima Accords from last week between the UK and Japan, the next sort of step of thinking is like, well, there is a natural convergence on certain things, whether it is quantum AI, hypersonics. So why not on a project base some of these actors? So you're saying that Pillar 2, in a sense, is a potential portal through Absolutely. which many other nations might pass and extend the security architecture, I mean, start uh, to, to embrace the re other, many, many other countries uh, uh, in the Indo-Pacific? Not many, because not many would have the technological know-how to be able to fully take advantage. But you're thinking of what, Japan? Japan, for sure. I mean, there's been conversation to an extent Japan with Japan and India, India Canada. South Korea. Mm -hmm. Canada. 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 Uh, other, other core NATO. Exactly. But on top of all of this, um, what well, you're going to find yourself in a situation, this is a point that Nicola alluded to earlier, is the one thing that if you are, uh, the Chinese leadership scares you the most. Having, sitting at the table, four or five members, states that are so close that there is nothing that you can do to drive a wedge in that relationship. That created a, um, a fabric that is stronger than anything. I'll give you a specific example of uh, recent experience. Last week at the first Sea Sea Power Conference, uh, which Kings, we helped to, to sort of deliver um, in part, you have the conversation between the first Sea Lord, the US Navy uh, um, Chief of Staff and the French Navy Chief of Staff. And they were talking on the back of each other. If I were sitting in Beijing looking at them, I would have a chill now going down my spine because I cannot replicate that with anybody. And that is a, a significant point okay. of distinction. Nicola, what's your 20 to 30 year forward look at the security environment and architecture flowing from AUKUS? Look, 20 to 30 years, you're looking at almost 2049. What, what's 2049? 2049 mm. is a very significant date. It certainly it's is. <laughs> the 100th centenary of the, the People's Republic of China, the, the version of China that we are currently living with. China, of course, has a very long history. So China will become more embattled. Um, politically, its environment will be a lot harder. Patriotism is high now, expect it to be higher then. Ir irrespective of who is in charge, and actually I want to make this point quite first forcefully, irrespective of who is in charge, whether we have a charismatic leader, an assertive leader, or we have more of a technocrat, China will behave the same, if not worse. Uh, in fact, many of the things that we see economically and military from China predate Xi Jinping, and they will continue after Xi Jinping. Um, I think what we should expect is probably, if, if AUKUS has been a success, particularly Pillar 2, then that will mean that China has not been able to pick apart um, and to argue that uh, AUKUS creates negative precedent for things like proliferation and so forth. Mm. And of course, AUKUS is not the first arrangement to do so. I think we've, uh, we, have, we forget our history. In 2006, the US and India signed a very controversial civilian nuclear agreement mm. um, that China had a lot of trouble with mm. uh, because India is not a member of uh, the nuclear suppliers group, it's not a member of the NPT, yet it still managed to go ahead and the world still continues. So AUKUS will probably square that circle quite nicely, I'm sure. Uh, but the question is whether Pillar 2 and, and other arrangements do the same, whether they do so flawlessly and bring others along, like Alessio said, whether they bring 
between Japan, which I think China expects, South Korea, which would be harder for China to swallow, India, of course, certainly mm. ha harder. I think we don't have, unfortunately, an India expert on the panel, but I think India's own sort of uh, independence in this and its own thoughts on this is, is uh, I think, harder to um, mm. lay out as, as easily as the Japan. So what we would see in the future, a closer China-Russia -Re relationship, of mm. course, uh, we would probably see, as I say, an internally more embattled and patriotic China, as hard as it might be to envision. And um, we might see even China acting in a more, um, dare I say it, normalised Western way when it comes to its military practices. So, for instance, actually just saying, yeah, we do have military bases and we're going to build more of them and we're going to have them in Pakistan, Laos, Cambodia and so forth. So I think that's a, a, a very divisive and militaristic future, but it is a potential one. Um, and particularly domestically in China, I think we haven't yet seen China talk as loudly and, uh, and, in, and in such a combative manner mm. as other countries have. So, for instance, let me just end with this. The most recent PLA, People's Liberation Army, strategic gu guidelines were published um, in 2019. These did not really take into account the idea of the Indo-Pacific, because at that point in time, China still did not officially mm. accept it. Mm. China now does. Um, the 2019 strategic guidelines, um, they did, did not take into account AUKUS. Now, if AUKUS is a success and, and China now sort of has come to some level of toleration and accommodation with the term Indo-Pacific as a geographical strategic space, then we will see some, some very hard-hitting national laws and also mm. PLA strategic guidelines that we have not yet experienced. Mm. Um, and China is actually, and I always say this to all my students, is actually very transparent. You just need to need, need to read the language. Um, they, will, they will be talking in a much harder language, and we should probably all prepare ourselves for that mm. uh, moving forward. And I'll end on that, on that note. OK. Who has over here, let's have a mic down, this gentleman, and then behind you. Thank you very much. I'm Tom Klaus Pritchard from the Pinsker Centre. We're delighted to sponsor uh, this conference, be one of the sponsors. We spoke We're very happy you're sponsoring it too. <laughs> th thank you. Um, we, we spoke a little bit about um, sort of political sustainability moving forward with AUKUS in Australia. I'd be very interested to get the panel's views on the political sustainability of AUKUS going forward in the United States. I was at a conference last year in California where I met a a young man in the Republican Party, I was talk talking to AUKUS about him, uh, uh, talking to him about AUKUS. And he said, oh yeah, was that when we really screwed over the French? And I said, well, I said jokingly, as an Englishman, well, that was uh, really the main appeal for us. Um, but uh, I think you, perhaps... You said uh, jokingly, yeah. Of course, of course, <laughs> yes. Um, uh, but yeah, um, sustainability politically of AUKUS in the United States. Well... Sustainability in the United States, I mean, they're pretty much in clover, aren't they? I mean, in trade, well, investment, procurement terms? Just if I can answer that or respond to that question just by segueing in on what's the world going to look like in 2049 or 2050, because okay. I think that's, it's an important reference yeah. point. If all of the current sort of economic projections hold true, then by the time we get to 2050, China... India, United States and Indonesia will be the four largest economies in the world. They're all in the Indo-Pacific. The Indo-Pacific will continue to be the area of economic uh, and, as a consequence, strategic heft. And China, more likely than not, will be the largest economy and the one with the most heft. And what we're trying to do now is to send signals which say, look, for the vast bulk of the post-World War II era, the Indo-Pacific has been a place for peace and prosperity. And we want that to continue. But for the first time, we're seeing a genuine great power rise in strategic competition with another great power. How do we manage that so that it doesn't end in disaster? And what we're seeing is a series of, in a sense, of concentric overlapping circles to send that signal and that message, which is about the United States doesn't stand by itself in a strategic competition with China. There are other equities and interests in the Indo-Pacific. And you see that reflected by AUKUS. You see it reflected by the Quad. You see it reflected by the United Kingdom uh, being a party to uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Who would have thought in 2007-08, when we started, Australia started thinking about the Trans-Pacific Partnership, that by 2023-2024, mm -hmm. the UK would be the second biggest economy in it? 
And so all of Europe, including the UK, has an Indo-Pacific reference point, has a what's the central strategic interest and issue here, which is, which is China and the way China conducts itself as a rules-based international player. And so what we're trying to do is to grow these sort of concentric circles. Um, East Asia Summit is another one, which Alessio referred to, which is the best piece of Indo-Pacific architecture where everyone's in the same room at the same time. Mm. In terms of U U US sort of, if you like, political sustainability, you know, we all have our moments of political instability. Australia had it, UK had it, United States I can't had think it. what you're referring to. Right? <laughs> okay. Maybe it's just an erroneous perception held by a, a, a colonial relic. You know? um, but, uh, you know, we all have our periods of, of sort of political instability or, or political moment. But in the end, we're all large economies, we're large uh, multi multinational players, we're large bilateral and, 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 and plurilateral players, you know, and all of our economies and all of our nations, I'm very confident, will sustain well beyond 20, 20, 2049, 2050. But what we're trying to do is how do we configure ongoing peace and prosperity in the Indo-Pacific, which has joined everyone now, I think, acknowledges with the, the, the Euro-Atlantic theatre, how do we keep that prosperity going? And to Australia, it is finding as many like-minded partners to have what our foreign minister describes as a regional balancing strategy so that if a large power wants to do something outside of the rules of the road, there are risks associated with that. Now, in the end, that can be backed up by diplomacy, but ultimately it needs to be backed up by the perception, if not the reality, of military capability to stare mm. down the notion that might is always right. And in parenthesis, which of the two countries is more likely to seek to come back into the now the CPTPP, America or China? Well, I think the single most adverse blunder that US policy has mm. made in the last 25 years was to effectively withdraw from the TPP. Mm. And all of us should be urging our US counterparts to get right back into it. That's the single most uh, important error of Indo-Pacific engagement that the United States have made, and it's ongoing uh, and needs to be rectified. It didn't quite answer my question, but it was. Uh, it, but I agree with you on the point you make. Just over here, there, and then we'll come to you subsequently. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Olivier Guita. I'm the Managing Director of Global Strat. Uh, I'm going to address the elephant in the room to piggyback on the, on the previous question and talking about the French. Uh, I think there was a huge blunder made by the alliance not to include the French in that alliance. France is the most present country in the Indo-Pacific. If you look at Macron's declarations before the cancellation of the contract of the century, he was very hawkish on China. And you have made him a dove. Uh, I think that the whole flack about including France in that alliance could have been extremely helpful. And I think Xi uh, is laughing all the way to the bank that you pushed away the French and got Macron to become a dog. OK, we've got the question. What's the answer? I'm, I'm, I'm happy Alessio, to and then we'll yeah. so, um, start with the European response. Exactly. Um, blame the, the foreigner. Keep it in the family. They keep it in the family. Um, Two quick points, and then they are related. On, on, on the previous, previous question, I think that is also we shouldn't forget the semantic effect of Pillar 2. We haven't talked about it, but Pillar 2 is designed to deliver sooner and that will create a semantic effect from, in terms of political, corralling political support across the three countries for continuity. And the second question there is also the strategic challenge is not going to go away. So, yes, political sort of uh, aspirations may change, but the main reason for AUKUS to exist in the first place is not going to go away. And the semantic effect of the conversation around corralling industrial um, uh, cooperation over the three countries, if not more, um, will certainly create an opportunity for that. Okay. But on this question of France, I don't think that France was left over. So, so first of all... You don't think France was... ..was left out of it? Because, because the door on Pillar 2 is absolutely open. That's one. Of course, Pillar 1 is an exclusive sort of type of project that sees the three countries together. And it seems to me that um, 
that's been now well understood. We have to separate between the rollout of the announcement of AUKUS, which certainly was not done in a way that apparently the French government was prepared for it. But I think now the relationship has moved on because of France-Australia relationships now are back on track. There is a new announcement about the importance of the strategic relationship between the two. And I think, in part, okay. the overcoming Pillar 1 problem, it's because of the centrality of Pillar 2. So France could come back via Pillar 2, do you think, or is that...? Well, I think generally on Pillar 2 and new partners, we should not get the cart before the horse, let the three AUKUS partners you know, sort of yeah. get, get it strategically yeah. gripped up and working before anyone else interest. But on, on France, look, firstly, when France was chosen by the previous government to build the conventional submarine, there was more than one commentator or people who'd followed submarines for a long period of time who thought that was the highest risk project. That's the first mm. point. Secondly, in the end, that highest risk project came to fruition. Thirdly, there are a number of off-ramps which was open to Australia under contractual terms to effect in the event Australia effected one of them. Now, it probably wasn't the most elegant or diplomatic way of doing it, but nonetheless, there was a contractual off-ramp which was open to Australia to take, and it did. I think the current government has worked very hard, and the current Prime Minister has worked very hard to restore and re-establish a strong Australia-France mm. relationship. And that is very important to Australia, because as the questioner rightly pointed out, France has more assets, and strategic equity in the Indo-Pacific than any other European country with New Caledonia. And I, not only do I acknowledge, I make the point repeatedly that when France got the nuclear, uh, the, the, sort of the conventional submarine contract, it was very forward leaning in saying, we see this not just as a capability project, we want to be an integral part of the Indo-Pacific, we want to be working closely with you strategically. And I think the current governor's done a lot and the current prime minister with the president has done a lot to bring mm. that back to a workable level. OK, very last question. I'm sorry, just there. No, thank you. Very quick, please. OK, very quickly. Um, my question is about uh, safeguards and weapons grade. Uh, China is voting in at least two papers in the last uh, NPT review conference and in a lot of papers in the agents that the ALCOS and the party of SSN uh, compromises the NPT because the That's uranium cool. used in S90G or PWR2 reactors are at weapons grade. So it's like something transferring um, nuclear material for weapons to a non-nuclear weapon states and this compromise the NPT. What do you think about this? Well, the, the Australian government has been very careful mm. to invite IAEA in on several occasions to very transparently and openly address some of these concerns. And um, the Australian government, I think, Stephen, has been assured that um, the sort of the supposition that you present in your question um, is, is, is not one that we should be concerned about. In addition, also, some of the Southeast Asian actors that have been, like Indonesia and Malaysia, have been relatively more sceptical about that. They're now changing their position slightly, precisely because of the recognition that the work done in engaging all the authorities over atomic energy have been satisfied. In fact, I think it was the first organisation that the three governments approached precisely to make sure that the transfer would actually reinforce the non-proliferation treaties rather than undermine their validity. OK. Peter, can I just jump in one last time before the panel closes? Yeah, sorry, Nicola. Sorry. That's OK. I mean, just to add that, as I say, there is precedence within the mm. nuclear field, and actually the nuclear field is one of my areas that I've worked on for a long time. And one of the discussions right now is actually around low-enriched uranium ra rather than HEU, high-enriched mm. uranium, in addition to, I think, AUKUS perhaps going above and beyond, and it needs to go above and beyond, even right. if it legally doesn't need to, um, it needs to go above and beyond in terms of sort of entering into some sort of special... Um, demonstration of safeguards in place uh, because of the uniqueness of this, because they don't want to create precedent and example for others others to follow. Exactly. Thanks. Last 30 seconds. Yeah, very qu quickly on the IAEA, Australia is engaged from day one with the IAEA exactly. and given a clean tick, clean tick of health. Just what we haven't mentioned in, in the course of this conversation, we've spoken a lot about AUKUS growing capability. What we haven't spoken about is China's military modernisation and the growth in its capability. Mm. 
China every year adds to its Navy surface fleet a number of ships which is greater than Australia's combined surface fleet. So, and there's no transparency of intent, there's no transparency of capability build, and there's certainly no transparency about what they're using to power their nuclear submarines, of which they have a handsome program moving forward. Mm. OK, thank you very much indeed, uh, uh, all of you. I must say that I would, if I had two things I took away from this panel, uh, it is that um, one region's strengthened capability in the Indo-Pacific can work to the strategic advantage mm -hmm. of the Euro-Atlantic, and we shouldn't see them as separate or in competition. And that secondly, Pillar 2 is a rather interesting portal through which mm -hmm a lot of um, close working relationships, mm. habits of exchanging technology, growing that software that we talked about uh, might pass in the future. Uh, and I think that is two very interesting points. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Um, if you please take a, take a seat. We heard uh, this morning from the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, and I'm absolutely delighted that we're now going to hear from the Shadow Secretary of State for Defence, uh, John Healy, who is in conversation with Professor John Gearson of King's College London. Thank you. OK, good afternoon. Um, as Ian mentioned, uh, my name is John Gearson, and I'm head of the School of Security Studies, who are co-hosting uh, this conference this afternoon. Um, very pleased to have uh, the Labour Party's uh, Shadow Defence Secretary with us this afternoon uh, to um, talk about uh, a range of, of, of things. Um, I'm going to ask a few questions, and we, we canvassed our student body uh, for some of these uh, conversations, and, and they've provided some tough questions, uh, which I'll be turning to uh, in a few minutes, if that's OK. And we'll, and we'll see where we get to uh, as, we're, as we're moving on. Uh, in fact, our, our students uh, usually start with a, a really tough one. Uh, which I, might, so I might start, actually, with the student one, because it's, uh, it's so broad. Uh, it, it's great. It's the sort of question they ask us uh, uh, quite often in classes. Um, and it's a start of a 10. Uh, what are Labour's long-term defence and security strategic objectives for Britain? Nothing, uh, nothing too specific there. And I guess they, they follow it by saying, um, in realistic terms, given that um, traditionally defence has been an area of less policy divergence. I mean, I think the last election was unusual in, in that there, were, there was probably a wider divergence between the two main parties. Um, how do Labour government's approach to national defence differ from the current government? OK. Uh, John, thank you for the invitation. Um, thank you all for staying the course this far. Um, I'm not sure whether I should be thanking your students for the questions, yeah. given that's the first of uh, a series of tough ones, but thank you to the students also for the way that they've, uh, as volunteers, marshalled this conference, and it's been really good to be able to speak to one or two of them on the margins of the conference, and I have to say to you, uh, to all of you, you know, if these are our future policymakers, potentially our politicians, our analysts and our industry leaders, we're in good hands. So, um, Labour defence and security priorities. I suppose I'd say five, um, and we, you might want to pick some of them up. First, to secure Britain as uh, Europe's leading nation within NATO. Second, to reinforce the UK-US relationship as our closest and most important security ally. Third, to rebuild relations with some of our important European uh, uh, NATO allies that have been damaged during the Brexit process, Germany, France, Poland, and sometimes willfully uh, so in the Brexit process, alongside looking to uh, strike a level of cooperation UK and EU um, with potentially an EU-UK defence and security pact, in other words, to restore the ambition that was in the political declaration that Boris Johnson took off the negotiating table in the uh, TCA uh, 
uh, period. So that's three. Four, I want defence to play a leading part in Labour's ambition to uh, make, sell, export more uh, from Britain. And fifth, I think after 13 years, ours is a nation whose moral contract with those who serve and their families has become corroded. It requires renewal. Uh, we will go into the election with a plan for that, and that will include uh, fully incorporating the Armed Forces Covenant into law. So five principal defence and security strategic objectives. OK, thanks. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll come back to uh, um, Europe and some other areas after that. Let me just press you a little bit more, another student-led question, uh, which is, um, what could we expect of the defence budget under, under a, a, a Labour administration? The Prime Minister this morning talked about being at 2.25%, uh, you know, talking up the fact that Britain was, was just uh, approaching the, uh, the NATO target, uh, despite... Uh, not reaching it in many respects, saying that the direction of travel was to 2.5 uh, in the medium term. I know you don't want to come out with your manifesto commitments at this stage, but you know, could you see, I think you've spoken about a need for investment in defence in, in some of your uh, articles and speeches. Um, can you see uh, an incoming Labour government with lots and lots of demands on the public purse yeah. um, actually being able to exceed a 2.5 target? You know, Two prime ministers ago, we were talking about four percent at one stage. Uh, now we're back in that sort of NATO average. You know, wh wh where is thinking within the Labour Party on, on the realities, given where we are with Ukraine, Russia? Well, first of all, it's a pretty good rule to judge politicians by what they do uh, rather than what they say. Um, our, our current uh, spending on defence is around 2.1 percent of GDP. Uh, Rishi Sunak was talking about 2.25 over the next few years and it, what he calls a longer-term aspiration um, as fiscal and economic circumstances allow for 2.5. Um, my starting point, Keir Starmer's starting point, uh, will be that Labour will always spend what's required on defence. Um, when we left government 13 years ago in 2010, we were spending in this country 2.5% of GDP on defence and that's a level that's never been close to getting matched in any of the 13 years since. The difficulty in opposition, um, and having spent some time in government, including at the Cabinet and uh, many years in opposition, the basic asymmetry that's there between government and opposition is particularly pronounced in the defence and security field. So we simply don't have access to the... Um, detailed information about threat assessments, uh, um, our own capabilities, real costs, which is why I've given the undertaking that in year one of a future Labour government, we would undertake a defence and security uh, review, a strategic review, and we would make our decisions about budgets and about priorities off the back of that. OK. Um, I was going to hold this up for later, but actually, as you've ended on that point, and, and with, a, with a commitment to a review, academics love that as something to analyse and comment on, and uh, I've spent uh, 30 years writing about defence reviews, so, uh, so I'm looking forward to another one, uh, whichever party wins the next election. Um, but we've had uh, an integrated review. Uh, we've had a refresh to the integrated review. Um, could you say a little bit about um, what you think you'd retain from the integrated review, and perhaps areas that, that, that you think are likely to be subject to, you know, quite, quite a close uh, a assessment during your review? Sure. But firstly, I don't think you're going to be out of work, John, whatever the result of the election, because I think the current government has said in 2025 they would undertake a further de defence and security strategic review. In large part, I have to say, that's because the big, difficult decisions have all been kicked beyond the next election. And the next couple of years and the financial context for the uh, Defence Command paper, the refresh of that that the Defence Secretary has promised next month, is really tough. Uh, he said before the spring budget um, in March, he needed £8 billion over the next two years just to cover for inflation. He got £5 billion, but that was earmarked for nuclear and for stockpiles. 
So no new money to cover inflation, no new money to deal with capability gaps, uh, no new money to deal with and respond to increased threats. So this is going to be a really, really tough period. And I think some of um, the indications that we got from the Prime Minister this morning about um, full-time armed forces numbers, I think we need to take seriously. Um, integrated review, well, I have to say that I think... Um, I'd probably reflect on three major, major, major changes, all of which I have, I, um, we, were, we were arguing hard for. The first is, uh, uh, I think, between the 2021 and 2023 um, uh, integrated reviews, we've happily left that gung-ho, go-it-alone, Britain in the world um, uh, bombast that we had from Boris Johnson when he launched the integrated review in 2021 20, behind. Um, Global Britain is mentioned once in the 2023 version, and that's in reference to its title uh, two years earlier. I think the reason for that, quite rightly, has been, especially in light of uh, Putin's invasion of Ukraine, this has reminded us of the fact that our allies are our strategic strength. And I think that has been part of the welcome wiring of the 2023 Integrated Review. The second is that there has been, I think quite rightly, a recognition of the need to rebuild relations with key European allies. We've seen that in the number of bilateral um, memoranda of understanding, defence declarations uh, and cooperation agreements. Uh, there's still a, uh, a lack of substance to too many of those and there's a lack of determination to strike a fresh um, framework for cooperation between the UK and the EU. Um, and then I think the, 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 the third is a sense that the Indo-Pacific tilt has been delivered. That's what it concluded in 2023. Um, and principally by non-military means. Now, I've always argued we want the integrated review to make the right calls. We want this to be a strategy for Britain. Uh, not just the strategy of the Conservative ministers that happened to be in government at the time. So on all those three uh, changes, we can certainly build and we certainly would build as a Labour government. The final thing, just to reflect, however, is that I, I see if you wanted a summary, this 2023 integrated review is a necessary rebalancing of uh, and a rectifying of the flaws in the 2021 integrated review. It is not the reboot of defence planning or spending that we've seen 25 other NATO nations undertake uh, since Putin invaded Ukraine. And that, if you like, is the, some of the big decisions that have been kicked down the road uh, until after the next election for whichever government, John, uh, happens to be elected by the British public. Sure. OK. I was interested in you talking about rebuilding defence cooperation with the EU. I just wonder whether there's a danger that you, you might be refighting arguments, frankly, almost a decade old in, in pursuing that line. You know, we've got NATO expansion that we've been discussing here this morning, quite unprecedented, uh, big geopolitical changes. Um, this is all post-Brexit. Um, and there's a lot of defence cooperation going on in, in Europe. Um, and the EU seems to be you know, the, the, the forum for cooperation on security, um, but defence does seem, and you yourself have talked about, uh, five minutes ago, talked about Britain as a leading NATO uh, European member and moving forward. I, I just wonder whether, whether there's a danger that Labour will get trapped in, in, a, in a conversation that, frankly, has moved on uh, by, by focusing on that. Because European defence does seem to have got a direction now which we didn't have before the invasion of Ukraine. Um, first, I think it's a necessary conversation and a necessary area of cooperation for the UK with the EU. Uh, but second, uh, I've argued for a NATO first policy. Uh, it is the cornerstone of our collective defence uh, and security. It is where the locus of UK leadership should lie. Uh, and that's lacking at the moment. Um, and 
so our first priority for our armed forces must be where the threats are greatest, and that's in the Europe, uh, North Atlantic and Arctic areas, the NATO area, if you like. And um, so that, that, that's the importance of, and, and first priority of NATO for any incoming Labour government. But you have to say that the European Union has, uh, in response to Putin's invasion of Ukraine, demonstrated there are things that it can do, um, principally in the security field and on the economic sanctions, um, but also a, with some of the military cooperation, for instance, the um, programme to uh, uh, fund and manufacture a million shells for, for Ukraine. So it, as NATO itself recognises, there has to be a complementary relationship. It needs to be settled, uh, and that requires leadership on both sides, and particularly from the NATO side. OK. So another question from the students, uh, if I may, and there were a lot of suggested questions about Ukraine, uh, as you, as you, you, you might have expected. Um, uh, it's quite a long question, unfortunately, but um, uh, I think it's worth trying to go through some, or unpick some of the things that our students think are, are important. So um, they want to know whether your priorities are essentially humanitarian or political in supporting Ukraine. Um, there's been a focus on, on the hard end um, by, by the current government on, in supporting Ukraine militarily. Uh, they ask whether a Labour government would be pushing much more for a deal, a peace deal with Russia, uh, which might involve compromises uh, um, such as Crimea uh, in return for security assurances. Um, and they ask whether Labour would actually support eventually uh, a Ukrainian application to NATO. Uh, yeah, at least half a dozen questions in that um, one. I said it was a long question. Um, our, our first and overriding priority is military, not humanitarian, um, because that's first and foremost the uh, priority for the Ukrainians. And that is based on deeper values. It's based on a, uh, a recognition that what they're fighting for is consistent with the values that we believe. They're fighting for freedom. They're fighting for the right as a sovereign country to determine their own future. They're fighting for the right to determine their own government as well as their own nation's future. And when I went to Kyiv a month before um, the Russian invasion was launched in, the, um, in January 2022, um, I met with a former prime minister there, um, Arseniy Yasenik, and he said, Western unity is Ukraine's best defence. And I was able to say to him there and then, uh, the UK will be united. There will be total unity in the UK to stand with Ukraine and confront Russian aggression. Because we recognise and understand that Putin's ambitions don't stop at Ukraine. That he is a dictator looking to redraw national boundaries by force. And he leads a regime which has contempt for international institutions, humanitarian law, rules of military conflict. And that despite the heroic bravery and extraordinary success of Ukraine in pushing back, defending their territory so far, uh, it seems to me that Putin's strategic aims haven't changed, that we face a, uh, a long-term, um, not just conflict in Ukraine, but wider Russian aggression and menacing of uh, European security, and that a, this will be a problem for the next government after the next election to deal with. Mm. So, um, on the question of what next? Our, our first priority must be to support Ukraine in every way to defend their values and their, and their country. And we're not fighting. We don't, get to, we don't get to call when the fighting stops or negotiations start. Our duty at that point is to give Ukraine the support in negotiations or any sort of future that we're, at, we're, we're working at at the moment. And. Uh, the government has had Labour's fullest support for the military help that we've been 
giving Ukraine. Um, I'm proud that the UK has led the way with training, with tanks, long-range missiles. But I want to be proud again in six months' time, in 12 months' time, of the UK leadership. Mm -hmm. I worry about the momentum uh, behind the UK support. Uh, and I have been concerned that too often we've had announcements that are ad hoc of military support, often coinciding with a prime ministerial visit or meeting or a um, defence or foreign secretary uh, um, conference. And one of the things that I've been pushing the government for is the what was promised actually back in August last year, a 2023 plan for Ukraine. <laughs> Military, humanitarian, diplomatic support that we will provide. Why is that important? For, for a number of reasons. First of all, it, it, it will help reassure Ukraine that our support will continue. Second, it will help kick our own industry uh, into, into action to manufacture the supplies that will allow us to do that. Third, like our leadership to date, it will help um, encourage allies to do more. And fourth, and most important perhaps, it will signal to Putin that things will get worse, not better, for Russia in the longer run. OK, um, I'm going to push you a little bit more. I mean, ultimately, most people believe that essentially deterrence failed in, in, in terms of Russia. And we can, we can point to the points at which that started to occur. But let's look forward. Um, how would a British government, a British Labour government perhaps, ensure conventional, let's leave the nuclear question separate, conventional deterrence could operate in a post-war Ukraine? How can we deter Russia from just doing it again in five or ten years after a ceasefire or even some sort of peace deal? Um, you know, how can Europe not find itself in this situation again? Well, I, I think one of the shocks to our system um, and to NATO thinking um, from Ukraine has reinforced the case for strong deterrence and for, as part, as part of demonstrating strong deterrence, um, the importance of numbers and of readiness. Um, so in terms of labour thinking, one of, the, one of the features that I'm or if you like, the, the things I'm urging Ben Wallace to do in his Defence Command paper is halt any further cuts to the British Army. Um, when uh, threats are increasing, further cuts to mm. army numbers um, are the wrong plan at the wrong time. And when NATO is increasing, to take the lesson from Ukraine, its high readiness force to 300,000, it is perverse that Britain at the same time is looking to and planning to cut uh, the strength of our full-time forces further. Mm. And it seems to me that this is driven by costs, not threats. And it seems to me that this is, sad to say, a result of the Defence Secretary's failure to win the new money from uh, the MOD that is needed to deal with the threats that we face. OK, thank you. Um, the, the other most raised question by the students, by the way, I'm hiding behind my students, uh, but the, the, it was genuinely from them, was I think that there is a, let's say there is a bit of confusion, certainly in our student body, ab about um, your policy on, on Indo-Pacific and, and AUKUS. Uh, a number of them quoted um, uh, a, a speech by David Lammy uh, about uh, the tilt causing an imbalance in, in UK geopolitical priorities. And what they, I think the best question summarises it, it said, if a Labour government imposes increased commitments to the Indo-Pacific tilt, how would a Labour Prime Minister respond to a systemic threat posed by China? Uh, well, China is a systemic uh, challenge. It's a systemic competitor. Um, Rishi Sunak explains some of the emerging um, thinking that we've had from the government, some of it reflected in the integrated review, some of it encouraged by um, us um, on the opposition benches. Uh, and we, by the way, endorse his resistance to some of the voices in his own party to designate China simply as a, uh, a threat. That's, that's the right judgment. Um, I think as a country, we're still 
coming out of that period where we were dazzled by what one of Rishi Sunak's uh, predecessors described um, as the golden era of relations with, uh, with, with China. As far as our approach as a Labour government goes, um, on AUKUS, 100% behind AUKUS. So from opposition, we made the same commitment that the Australian Labour Party did at the time um, when they were in opposition before they won the election. And they haven't changed very much, as we heard in our previous panel, of the policy since getting No, out. no, absolutely. So they've doubled, they've doubled down. Yeah. It's of strategic significance. Yeah. Uh, it's of industrial significance. It's of the deepest possible strategic and industrial significance. Um, there, is, there is a massive challenge for us on AUKUS in this country. I, I don't want to deal with it at length because you've had a panel on that. But just to say two, two things. Um, if we simply see this as a submarine building challenge rather than a national enterprise, we will fail. We'll fail the US and we'll fail Australia as our strategic allies here. Um, BAE Systems employ 11,000 people in Barrow. They've got to scale that up to 17,000. Uh, they already employ one in three of the wor working age population in that town. This is not a, simply a skills problem. This is about Barrow as a uh, new garden city, rapid rail links. Um, we've got to see this as a national endeavor and a long-term long commitment. And it needs big thinking. And I worry at the moment that the, the, the locus of leadership on AUKUS in Britain is, is unclear. Mm -hmm. I think we miss Stephen Lovegrove, who did a great deal of the work up to December last year when he left government, and it's not clear to me that we've got the leadership that's required. The second side is that just as important, but without the, again, the sense of leadership and certainly without the policy or political objectives, is the pillar two potential. And I'd like to see um, the government spell out the way that we can help forge the way ahead um, in Britain on Pillar 2. Um, if, if they don't ahead of the election and we get elected, we will have to do that. On the Indo-Pacific more widely, um, two or three reflections, I suppose, really. I think Ukraine's shown us that the coalition of countries that support Ukraine's fight isn't just located uh, in North America or in Europe. So some of our closest, uh, most reliable allies in supporting Ukraine have been in the Indo-Pacific. And they, they worry, and we share those concerns, about the rising military force and the increasing assertiveness and aggression of, of China. And we should, and we would as a Labour government, um, support those allies in every way we can through technology, through capability, through diplomacy, and yes, through closer industrial collaboration like on the AUKUS program. But I've all urged a degree of realism about our military commitments in the Indo-Pacific, um, especially at a time when our forces are stretched. I think they're badly served by leaders who uh, pretend they can do everything everywhere in the world. And the support that we can give to allies, the contribution we can make to the strategic security balance um, in the Indo-Pacific is powerful in ways other than straightforward military deployments. OK, I've got time. To, I want to raise two more things with you uh, sure. in the time left to us. And they actually relate to things that you raised in your terms of your priorities. So the first one was this British first uh, ap approach. Um, and in fact, this is something that was raised by, by the students. Uh, this idea of directing investment towards British industry um, in these international collaborative projects, is, is, this, is this really uh, effective? And, and, and do you think it's going to actually deliver what, what the UK does? There's lots of experience where we end up, you know, not quite buying off the shelf, certainly not, but we end up actually being in very complex international consortia uh, and procuring, well, sometimes not procuring, uh, things that we've spent a long time on. Do, do, do you really believe the actual British defence sector is capable of providing you with, the, with this equipment? I do. 
Uh, it can be. It hasn't in recent years, and largely because we've dealt with defence acquisition and procurement on a contract-by-contract -contract basis. Uh, competition and cost has ruled all else. Um, and if you wanted one or two hallmarks of the way that that would need to change, I think needs to change, by the way, uh, whichever party wins the next election. Um, f f first of all, when we're spending as a nation at least £20 billion a year of taxpayers' money, British taxpayers' money, um, the British taxpayer has, I think, a right to expect more for bangs for that buck. So, um, if we can direct British investment first to British companies and British jobs, we should. Second, uh, defence acquisition should not be uh, essentially an isolated area of policy. And I'd want to see it um, as a centrepiece of a modern industrial policy that uh, does more to make, sell and buy in Britain. Third, the collaboration is clearly um, required on big, uh, big projects. But we have too often driven too poor a bargain on the work share, the leveraged investment for the contracts we place with either American or uh, um, companies from other countries. We can do better on that. Um, the fourth, I think, finally, is um, we've sometimes lost sight in uh, the specifications of what we're looking for, of the capabilities required by those forces on the front line. Um, of course, um, high tech will reinforce the um, capability in the longer term, but we need to be able to, and Ukraine tells us this, we need to be able to um, commission some of the now tech needed, not just the high tech needed for the future. I mentioned 30 years in uh, commentary on defence. Procurement initiatives, I'll just say to you, smart procurement, both parties, uh, good luck is all I can say if one, you do form the next government. One thing you have argued for, and you, 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 I mean, you've authored this, um, I mean, you, you did a report three years ago on whole force, the whole force concept. Now, that was essentially an argument that if you want a country to be um, secure and capable for the future, you have to have government working alongside in a strategic partnership and long-term partnership with your leading industry um, players. That hasn't been happening, and it's part of what needs to happen in the future. And uh, I think that was what I was. We need, if ever we need a lesson, uh, it's it, and a wake-up call to do that. It's surely Ukraine and the uh, longer-term um, <coughs> challenge of China as well. Well, I think, and uh, that was my concluding question mindful that we started late, but we're, we're running over a bit. And that was this, this moral components in the armed forces. Um, I, well, I, will, I will put this to you, that yes, that, that is a noble objective, but it'll only be given, or it'll only be effective if you actually apply this to the whole force that you've just raised, the, the whole defense sector that, that delivers capability for the UK. I don't know how you feel about that. Or do you want to focus on the armed services uh, initially on, on this idea of the moral component? Uh, well, we have to do more on the moral component. It's just not... Um, well, it's, it's not acceptable, but it's also not viable if your satisfaction uh, ratings are less than 50% of those who are serving. It is completely unacceptable that 40% of our forces uh, accommodation is in the lowest possible category. Um, and 4,000 of our forces personnel are living in accommodation that is so poor, even the MOD won't charge them any rent on it. Now, that's, a, if you like, a symptom of how we've allowed this um, contract with those who serve um, to be corroded over the recent years, and we've got to renew that. OK. All right. Well, as I said, I think it's also about trying to extend that to the reserves. Sure. That would be an important part of it, but also the civil servants who support it and, of course, partners in the industry. Um, well, thank you for fielding uh, my students' questions and my questions very much, and uh, we, we look forward to you taking an active part in the policy debates uh, in the run-up to the election. John, thanks very much. I look forward to that too. Thank, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Could I call you to order? We have a particular treat this afternoon. Anyone who has had the experience of visiting Poland uh, before the wall came down, 
and has subsequently visited the country will be astonished, as I have been, by the extraordinary economic transformation that has taken place. And this has given Poland not only an extraordinary, exciting future, but at the moment, a considerable amount and a growing amount of economic heft within Europe as well as more broadly. And I think uh, it would be fair to say that that uh, resultant economic and political heft has not been entirely without controversy within the European Union. More pertinent to us this afternoon is uh, the extraordinary transformation in Poland's military capability based on not a 2.1 or 2.25, whichever of the two statistics we've earlier had, had heard today of our own defense expenditure, but a full 4% of Polish GDP, and I think rising. The importance of Poland, which was increasing anyway, has been, of course, greatly underlined by the crisis in Ukraine, where they have been a leading voice in advocating maximum support for Ukraine. And not only have they used their voice, but they have backed it up by action. They have been an increasingly important part of that effort, and it is a part they are playing in full today, not only militarily, but by, the, uh, by accommodating the enormous number of Ukrainian refugees on their territory. So we are extraordinarily honored and lucky to have with us this afternoon the President of Poland, President Duda, who we welcome and are delighted that he's made time to address us this afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of Poland. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Excellency, thank you very much for your kind words and thank you very much for this invitation. This is really unique opportunity for me to participate in this London Defence Conference and to share with you some opinions and some thoughts about challenges we have ahead of us. So, ladies and gentlemen, on February the 24th, we woke up to a totally new reality. It was February the 24th, 2022. The Russian aggression forced many to redefine their so far policy. The thought of a war in Europe with indiscriminate killing of civilians bombardments of residential buildings, schools and hospitals was hard to believe to many. And still, that is exactly what happened after the 24th of February last year. I wish to remind you that, unfortunately, it's nothing new for Russian imperial policy. Central and Eastern Europe remembers that terror under the Russian occupation at the time of the Iron Curtain. We also recall the wars in Chechnya, Georgia, and Moldova, which followed after 1991. Therefore, the current aggression against Ukraine and the attempt by the Kremlin to suppress the sovereignty of the Ukrainian people comes as no surprise to us. As early as 2014, we knew that Russia would not stop in Crimea, Donetsk, and Lugansk. Ladies and gentlemen, in a broader view, the aim of the Kremlin is to regain control over the so-called post-Soviet zone and 
destroy the current world order. For Putin, the West was weak and disunited. There were a few reasons of that assessment. The major ones were political and economic factors. The West was afraid that the strong reaction might cause big turbulences in political relations. Moreover, many states were concerned about losing lucrative contracts with Russia. Many in the West fooled themselves, thinking that in the area of extensive economic connections, gigantic product, projects such as Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2, it would be impossible to make a step further and take a decision to invade, which, should, which would shatter all of that. Meanwhile, Russia was testing for decades how far it could go using its various forms of aggression and how much the West would allow it to do. Ladies and gentlemen, expansion. Expansion, that is exactly the priority of the Russian policy. An attempt to subdue others by means of blackmail, conquest, force and terror. The Kremlin is ready to pursue that goal no matter what the cost. For those who still have doubts if Russia stops in Ukraine, let me remind the words of the former Russian president Medvedev, who said clearly, the aim of the war in Ukraine is to undermine the current world order built after the Second World War and establish the new one. He has said, I have no doubt that this new world order would be against the values that are of importance to us. It would be based on aggression, fear, and total control. There would be no respect for freedom of citizens, the value of human life, the rule of law, and democracy. Ladies and gentlemen, we must redefine, once again, the so far perception of threats. This moment is especially crucial for Europe, which has to stand up to the biggest challenge since the, since, since the Second World War. We must to be united in showing that we do not accept an aggression in the 21st century. We have to stress loud and clear that we do not agree to the violation of international law, which we had established based on our shared values of freedom, equality, sovereignty, and independence of nations. Let us also bear in mind that today's conflict in Europe has a much broader dimension. Russian aggression has global consequences. It's proved by the crisis Russia has caused the energy and food ones. They, af they affect Asia, Africa, and the Middle East alike. In the long term, this crisis will spill over and impact all regions of the world, ruin our economies, and hinder the development of states. Our resolute response should also be a signal to those who adhere to different principles and are inspired by the Kremlin's activities. Weak opposition will serve as an incentive for those potentially aggressive countries to start actions in other regions of the globe, which may be harmful for all of us. That's why our response has to be swift strong and efficient. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Poland understands this perfectly well. That's why since the launch of the Russian invasion, we have been supporting Ukraine in international forums, seeking backing for Kyiv as well as condemn condemnation and sanctioning of the Kremlin. 
we have been supplying extensive aid both in Poland and in Ukraine. Let us remember that more than 15 million people have left Ukraine since the outbreak of war, of which almost 12 million crossed the border with Poland. Most of them are elderly persons, women and children. They found shelter in Polish homes, welcomed by Polish families and not in refugee camps. Frankly, there was no need to build refugee camps because all the people who came from Ukraine, they found accommodation among Polish families in Polish houses, in Polish homes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Over the last year, we were able to set up a huge logis logistic hub in Poland, which allows for the transfer of humanitarian and military assistance to Ukraine. For those who were not willing to leave their homeland and whose households were destroyed, we have established, along with our British friends, a temporary container town in Lviv. However, as I said before, we are not going to bring the hostilities to an end by means of political and humanitarian support only. Hence, Poland is one of the biggest suppliers of military equipment for the fighting Ukrainians. Up until now, we have provided over 300 battle tanks, hundreds of infantry fighting vehicles, artillery systems, mortars, and anti-aircraft capabilities. We've, we have equipped thousands of Ukrainian soldiers with Polish-made Grot assault rifles and millions of ammunition shells of various types. We were also one of the first states to hand over our MiG jets to Ukrainian pilots. These aircraft allow them to protect their skies against Russian attacks. With fights ranging in Ukraine, we, along with other partners, continue to train new Ukrainian recruits as part of the EU mission. Having said all of that, I wish to thank the United Kingdom for all its involvement, support, and most importantly, for joining the tank coalition. Ladies and gentlemen, after the victory, we will face the task of holding the guilty ones to account for the war crimes committed. We will also have to help Ukraine to reconstruct the country. I count on Poland playing a leading role in this respect as we have rele relevant assets which will facilitate the process. What I mean is first of all our geographical as well as social and cultural proximity. What is more, we know what kind of reforms are required in state that was politically and economically dominated by Russia. It's also part of our history. Ladies and gentlemen, the situation across the region forces us, like never before, to join efforts in strengthening the North Atlantic Alliance, which needs to deter the aggressor effectively. Of key importance in these respects will be the Vilnius summit decisions. Poland has the following priorities. One, boosting the defense potential of the eastern flank by increasing the number of NATO troops deployed there. Two, reforming NATO response force along with the Madrid summit decisions by implementing the new force model and scaling up the high readiness forces from 40 up to 300,000 troops. Three, establishing 
a multi-corps land component command in Poland based on the opera operational command and for motivating all allies to increase their defense spending. And let me stress, all allies. We must bear in mind that NATO forces are not just the US troops. It's our joint potential contributed by each and every member of the Alliance. Let me recall that if we want Article 5 to provide ironclad security guarantees, then the provisions of Article 3 have to be strictly, strictly followed. And Article 3 stipulates that every one of us, each NATO member, has to individually maintain and develop the capacity to resist armed attack in order to effectively deter an aggressor what we need is not only the effort of the alliance as a whole but also our own one we keep bolstering our defense potential in order to meet allied commitments we are spending on defense, preparing modern legisl legislative solutions, expanding and modernizing our armed forces, forming new units and providing them with modern equipment integrated with that of our allies. At the same time, we take note of emerging threats. That is why we continue to develop our capabilities across all domains, including especially in cyberspace. All of it is costly, but the Polish society understands why we are developing our armed forces and why we are helping Ukraine by supplying with it with part of our equipment. For Poles know perfectly well that the cost would be even higher if Ukraine lost. I'm glad that we are not alone and we are developing capabilities along with our strong allies. Polish-British military cooperation is historically important and it goes decades back. Currently, our forces are involved in allied operations and exercises around the globe. Polish soldiers serve in NATO commands in the UK, whereas the British ones do the same in Poland. In 2022, British engineering troops helped to protect Polish border in the aftermath of the Belarusian hybrid attack. Moreover, starting this year, we have a British company of Challenger 2 tanks deployed in Poland, as well as soldiers stationed together with a Sky Sabre air defense system. We are implementing a number of bilateral projects as part of the military technology collaboration. And by doing so, we maintain a dialogue which contributes to a stronger industry and more robust defense capabilities. Together we can do more. Therefore, I appreciate the so far engagement of the British on the European continent, both on bilateral as well as allied level. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, as I mentioned at the beginning of my speech, the challenging international situation today requires our involvement also beyond our region. We must start to talk together with the countries of the global south, especially Africa. I see a special rule for Poland in this respect, whom they consider a credible partner. Lack of my country's colonial past might help us all in these contacts. Distinguished guests, Ladies and gentlemen, in order to restore the global order based on our shared rules of equality, respect and sovereignty with respects for international law, 
We must respond to aggression in the un united way and discourage anyone willing to try and change the world by force. Europe must stay united and help Ukraine. It's only with our help that the end of this war will be possible. It's only with our help that those guilty of the committed war crimes, rapes, murders, the destruction of houses, hospitals and schools will be held to account. We must also be open towards other regions in the world. In this way, we will be able to jointly bring back stability and international security. I thank the United Kingdom for its cooperation to ensure security in Europe. Thank you for supporting Ukraine and for your clear stance on the Russian aggressor. We are strong in the alliance. We are strong together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President. That was uh, a timely reminder of the contribution that Poland is making, not only in Europe and in the Ukrainian crisis, but more broadly. And I, for one, certainly took to heart your most interesting suggestion about your role that, as your possible role in Africa. We should think more about that. Thank you for coming, and thank you for what you said to us. <laughs> well, thank you ever so much for lasting right until the final and the best session of this first day. Um, my name's Deborah Haynes. I'm the security and defence editor at Sky News, and I have a very eminent panel to talk about NATO and European security. I'm going to sort of introduce everybody. They're not going to give spiels. Um, as a journalist, I've been told I'm allowed to ask a few questions, which is great. Um, and then I'm going to open it up for audience questions. So if you wouldn't mind when that happens, you stick your hand up and introduce yourself and your question and direct it at who you'd like it to be asked to. That would be great. Um, so we have uh, Lord Zedwell, who you will all know, um, the previous national, well, not previous, previous but one, national security advisor and former cabinet secretary, eminent career in the civil service before that. Um, we have Ruth Diermont, who is a, um, an expert in post-Soviet studies here at King's College. We have Jeremy Greaves, who is vice president of Airbus and a, a renowned expert in defense industry. And a late stand-in, very kindly, we have Peter Watkins, who has a long career in the civil service at the MOD and is now a visiting professor here at King's too. So a brilliant um, panel to talk about European NATO security and off the back of that very interesting speech from the Polish president and also this morning that speech from our Prime Minister. Um, different tones, I'm sure you'll agree, um, with Poland agreeing to spend 4% this year of its GDP on defence. Uh, the British Prime Minister very clearly saying they're moving up to 2.25% and then 2.5% when fiscal circumstances allow. Um, I thought with the NATO summit in Vilnius on the horizon in July, Mark, would you want to give some thoughts on what you think deterrence is going to need to look like um, going forward into the next 10 years, deterrence in particular against Russia in the wake of the full-scale invasion? Oh, thanks, Deb. Uh, very good to be here, and, and thanks for um, uh, having the chance to be on, uh, be on the panel. Um, I think there are essentially two elements to deterrence um, uh, after, uh, in the aftermath of Ukraine. Uh, the first is that the Ukrainians themselves have demonstrated um, the Russians uh, can be... Um, contested, defeated uh, militarily, and, and it's quite clear that uh, up against NATO, uh, in a purely conventional um, uh, battle, uh, we would, uh, we or certainly should, be able to overwhelm them. Now, what does that mean? I think that means that we have to change NATO doctrine on deterrence. If you think back to the Cold War, fundamentally, 
we had um, uh, the potential. Peter's a, a deep, much deeper expert in this than I. But we essentially uh, retained the option of first use of nuclear weapons to offset what we perceive to be a conventional imbalance in favour of the Soviet Union. That's no longer true. Uh, and therefore, uh, we need to beef up NATO's conventional uh, defence and thus deterrence. I think that means deploying more forces um, uh, forward uh, to NATO's eastern border, not just the enhanced forward presence, which is essentially a tripwire, uh, but uh, more uh, forces forward in order uh, to be able to deal with a conventional threat from uh, Russia without having to resort to the escalation potentially to nuclear. I also take the view that we need to revise our nuclear doctrine as well. Uh, this will be controversial. A lot of people in the audience won't agree with this. I think we should, we should be clearer that any use of nuclear weapons, out, even outside NATO territory, like what the use of weapons of mass destruction in Syria, is completely unacceptable, and a military response is on the table. It doesn't necessarily mean a nuclear response, but a military response must be on the table uh, against any use of weapons of mass destruction. So I'd like to see a sharper um, uh, nuclear deterrent, um, uh, 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 component of nuclear deterrence, and a, a more um, forward um, uh, element of conventional deterrence. And, and just, I'll just, uh, just to follow up on that nuclear front, because you did sort of uh, write about this in your article in The Economist earlier this year, um, when you said about that need to be to, to, to prevent, to reduce the risk of misunderstanding um, on the Russian side, that need to kind of, to, to articulate um, the, 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 the fact that a nuclear attack would be met with some kind of military response. In what way do you think NATO should, should articulate that? Well, I think we can, uh, we can refresh our doctrine. Um, so it, it isn't simply about Article 5 and the defence of territory. I think uh, it doesn't necessarily mean extending Article 5 beyond NATO territory. I don't think that is realistic. But I think it is right that, we, uh, that NATO commits that, uh, that there will be a, would be a response should there be a use of nuclear weapons out of area that we perceive to be a threat to NATO uh, NATO security, because it isn't only within uh, NATO territory. And the precedent is the action taken by the US, France and the UK in Syria in 2018 when they used chemical weapons against their own uh, people and we took conventional military action in order to degrade their capability, their chemical weapons capability, their command and control systems, and try and restore deterrence against the use of chem chemical weapons, having failed to do so, of course, in 2013, which probably uh, prolonged the Syrian civil war. So the precedent is there, um, uh, and I think there should be a sharper, clearer element to NATO doctrine. Now, as I say, not everyone will agree with that, but it just seems to me we can't have conventional aggression um, taking place under a nuclear umbrella, which is what Putin tried in the early uh, phases of this conflict until even his, um, his friends um, in Beijing, for example, um, uh, essentially walked him back from that. I, don't, I just think we have to be ready to remove that nuclear umbrella for conventional aggression. And Ruth, how do you think um, Russia would respond to that, to any kind of change in NATO doctrine when it comes to nuclear weapons? Because, of course, anything to do with nuclear can be perceived as escalatory even if it doesn't really change much. I mean, rhetorically, obviously, um, the Russian government, I think we could expect them to, to respond very strongly indeed. But in terms of significant change um, kind of on the ground, I, I think it's unlikely. I mean, it, part of the, the problem for, I think, for the Russian government now is that they have, with the entirety of this war, been kind of hinting at the possibility of nuclear use. Um, if their red lines are crossed. Um, and this has not happened over and over again, which I think is one of the things that changed the dynamic um, more generally. I, you know, I think um, <laughs> it's very, very hard to say um, you know, how the Russian government is going to respond, given that the Russian government now seems to be itself quite unstable. Um, so I think it's in order to make a judgment about that, we would need to say with some certainty um, who the Russian government is, is going to be. Um, and it is not, at least to me, entirely clear um, that a year, two years down the line, um, that the person in charge is going to be Putin. Um, and a change at the top is going to absolutely change the dynamic on, on nuclear issues as on everything else. And how do you think um, the Kremlin is viewing the way that NATO has um, adapted um, so quickly, relatively speaking, since February 2022, compared with 
the invasion and annexation of Crimea back in 2014. What do you think they're going to, uh, Russia is going to be looking at when it sees NATO allies meeting in Vilnius in July? I mean, clearly, they were, I think they were stunned. Um, this was absolutely not what they expected. Um, for, for all sorts of reasons, you know, for, for years before February 2022, um, the Russian government had been pushing this narrative which they themselves seem to believe that the West is weak, the West is divided, um, the West has been undermined by liberal values and an and unwillingness to actually get together and, you know, defend um, their interests. And I don't think the invasion could have happened without that prior assumption. And that was partly, I think, it was based on a number of things. It was partly based on um, the pretty limited response to, um, to the Russian annexation of Crimea, of Crimea in 2014. Um, so, I, th I mean, I think they're still groping in the dark, really, as to, to how the West is going to respond in future, given that all their assumptions for years have been undermined. Um, so they're clearly going to be watching it enormously closely. Um, I, you know, again, uh, what they can do about it is really unclear. They're, they're on the back foot comprehensively in a way that they never have been before, and I don't think that they're able to adjust doctrinally or um, you know, in how they see the world. Um, Jeremy, I'll come to you with a question on industrial base in a sec, but Peter, just sort of following on from this thought about deterrence, um, you said an interest. We, we were sort of talking in the green room before we came on about um, about how uh, I, I was just sort of saying that, that um, you know, Western like the, the the full scale invasion of Ukraine by Russia uh, was a failure of Western deterrence. Um, and I was wondering what you thought about that because you said you had a couple of thoughts. Um, well, unfortunately, it's true, um, and people don't like me saying that. Um, indeed, I usually get told off um, by former official colleagues. But I'm talking here about a failure of deterrence in a conceptual sense, because the West tried to deter Putin from invading Ukraine, and it threatened massive um, consequences, etc., etc. and it didn't work. Um, it may be that it would never have worked. One of the problems with deterrence is when you have an, what they call an asymmetry of interest. So one side's interest in the outcome is so much bigger than the other that they're prepared to accept costs which the other wouldn't. I think it's also because, um, and this goes go back to what Mark was saying, you know, somebody who did deterrence for years, I thought we made, um, if I may, I don't think we did it right. We forgot the playbook. And one of the points about the deterrence playbook is you do not preemptively take options off the table. And that's what we did. We said there would be no military um, aspect. We set out our stall of economic measures, but we left out the ones that were really painful. Um, of course, the irony was after the invasion, um, certain countries, they can say nameless, but they can remain nameless who had been blocking those measures then agreed to them. And so, as you say, the Russians then came up against a much bigger response than they were expecting. But I just need to clarify in one respect. So deterrence conceptually, you can say, didn't work. And there are lessons that we can learn for next time. NATO's deterrence has worked. And when Ruth says the um, Russians have crossed a number of their red lines, that is because NATO's deterrence has worked. Um, so the Russians have threatened all sorts of consequences. If you remember the language that Putin used at four o'clock in the morning on the 24th of February last year. I mean, we've done what he told us not to do. Um, individual countries like Poland, particularly the Baltic states and so on. And they've been able to do that because NATO's deterrence posture and its nuclear deterrence posture is working. It's deterring the Russians from going further. Um, so that's, that's good. We mustn't be complacent about it. We must think, as Mark said, about ways in which we make it more effective. Um, and while well, I've got the floor, if I may, um, I mean, I think what the most likely outcome of what's happening now, regardless of who wins or what um, Ukraine's victory, as we were discussing this morning, looks like, is we're going to be in to a an extended, prolonged, uh, in, intense confrontation with Russia. Yeah. Um, it will be either a 
relieved and proud Russia that they eventually got what they wanted, which I don't think they will, or they will be an angry Russia that will think it was stabbed in the back and all the rest of it. And we need to, and there is a risk in those circumstances that the Russian leadership might, in my view, you may disagree, might do something that we would regard as reckless um, and might try and spread the conflict and so on. And we need to make sure that we deter that. Um, and I think we do that, and I think there is a role for NATO here, not only by updating our doctrine in some respects, I probably wouldn't go quite as far as Mark, but I'm very cautious, um, but also in terms of um, continuing to update our capabilities, which we'll no doubt come on to. But the other side of deterrence is deterrence by punishment, there's deterrence by denial. And one aspect of that is resilience. Because if we get into this prolonged standoff with Russia, they won't necessarily conveniently just send a tank over somebody's border. They might attack us in all sorts of areas. You know, soft areas, disinformation, etc. We have quite a vulnerable energy infrastructure. We should be thinking about ways in which we make ourselves resilient for that. It could last for decades, that confrontation. Well, just on that point of, uh, of the sort of like the, the need to prolong deterrence, um, do you think there is a risk? Because uh, we, have, we heard from the panel this morning, it was quite an upbeat, really, assessment of, 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 the, of the battlefield, of what's going on the ground. And it's very hard to, uh, to, to predict how the machinations are going to play out. And clearly, Ukraine is about to go once again on, on the offensive. Um, as it has been since the beginning of the, well, the counteroffensive, as it has been since the beginning. Um, but if Russia does hold on, and there's no sense that Putin, if he stays in power, has any intention of stopping fighting, he doesn't actually really need to gain any more ground than he already has to um, basically undermine and defeat the, um, what Ukraine has defined itself as success, which is to remove every single Russian boot off its soil. And so then, if you look at how the West has responded since the 24th of February last year with this, like you said, this massive change of policy, countries like Germany, like France, really coming to the table, um, boosting their defence spending um, and giving weapons in a way that we hadn't seen before. And yet you're also exposing how hollowed out Western militaries, in particular our own, for example, given the leading role that we play, have become since the end of the Cold War. And you're not really seeing the same energy going forward in the change that's needed to put our, you know, our defence industrial base on a war footing, for example, to ensure that when Russia does look our way or China does look our way, that they see credible um, depths of deterrence. What do you think about that? Um, well, every conflict that's been fought since... I mean, I joined the MOD not long before the Falklands uh, conflict. Every conflict has shown that the expenditure of munitions in reality is vastly greater than either the, the actual... either the plans or what governments were prepared to invest in. So we are going to have to think rather differently about that. Um, and we might want to think... Um, I don't think it's just a matter of piling up stuff. Exactly. We need to look, and this is more Jeremy's area than me, we might want to look at ways in which we move towards a more, if you like, flexible industrial structure. I stockpile the rare components, the things that you must get hold of in a, in a hurry, but look at ways in which one might... I mean, I'm, I'm being a policy person here, I'm not worrying about the acquisition reality. One might be able to adjust so that one can scale up and scale down. That would mean governments being prepared to pay for capability and capacity that they're not using on a day-to-day -day basis, which they're not very comfortable about doing. But, you know, hasn't COVID and the health service shown that one has to be prepared to do that? Yeah, I was really struck by what the Polish president said about how the Polish society really understands the need for expanding um, the Polish armed forces and for equipping uh, Ukraine. I, I wonder whether the British society has that same fundamental understanding of the need to uh, invest and secure our, our armed forces, for example. Um, Jeremy, can you um, offer your thoughts on what Peter was talking about, about this, you know, the need for some kind of signal from government to give 
industry the confidence to make the investments in the expansion of production capacity perhaps at risk in the national interest? Is that even possible without an actual war on our streets? Well, of course, that, I mean, that is a, a government policy issue. It is, it is industry's role to support government and the government priorities. Um, but I think it's fair to say that uh, clearer demand signals uh, would be welcome uh, by everybody. I mean, there's, I, you know, defense and deterrence especially, you know, it has to rely on capability and you can only provide capability with a sound industrial base that is capable of uh, sustaining your, your objectives. And so, you know, and, and, and we as a nation can't do it on our own. You know, that's why we have NATO. You know, that's why we're part of this, this sort of a multilateral Western dialogue. Um, and I think one of the reasons why, you know, I'm here is, is, is Airbus represents the industrial vision of, of Europe made real. And the way we need to cooperate and you know, post Brexit, there was a bit of a wobble, but we were incredibly uh, um, um, uh, gratified to see last week the Secretary of State mentioned that the MOD especially was was going to uh, increase its cooperation with the EU and look at uh, new mechanisms. And 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 that, you know, from our perspective, has to be a a, a really good uh, measure. And it and and it won't come before time because. The EU is looking at certain industrial policy levers that might leave the UK vulnerable and exposed. And what do I mean by that? I actually mean that you know the UK could be treated as a, a third party. And if the UK is treated as a, a third party, our industrial sector and our industrial base will also be treated as a third party and it will potentially miss out on the investment that is being made in the EU uh, now. And actually, you know, this, this cooperation and uh, collaboration that, that is represented not just by, by Airbus, but actually by other hugely successful uh, companies and programs. You only have to look at MBDA, you only have to look at the Typhoon program. Uh, um, I mean, you know, we've got to make sure that we don't lose out on those uh, capabilities because the UK fundamentally has a significant role to play in the defence of Europe, not just operationally, not just capability, but industrially as well. And, and you know, we have a lot of uh, talks with our colleagues in Europe and they are all adamant that they want the UK to play a leading role in those capabilities. And, and they want the, um, the, the industrial base of UK to be part of the wider defence of Europe. Why? Because we have incredible capabilities, not just in the conventional uh, uh, areas of defence, but in these new disruptive technologies that I mean, you know, are represented here in uh, London. So AI, the quantum computing stuff, we can inject that into European programmes to benefit Europe and to benefit the UK. But are you seeing a sense that, that the EU is actually working at the speed of relevance when it comes to defence procurement projects? Because it does seem it's got a history of being incredibly slow and that doesn't seem to have changed in the last 15 months or so. Well, actually, I, 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 would, I would argue that the EU has been much clearer Thierry Breton's um, uh, announcement just a couple of weeks ago about a 500 million investment into rearming Europe was a major and bold step. And the UK potentially will miss out on that. So I, I genuinely think, you know, there are a number of things that we need, you know, to do. And, 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 and if I might make a specific point, you know, the US has said that it wants Europe to be responsible, more responsible for its own uh, defence. And as part of that, I mean, a strong policy uh, statement, you know, it, it stands to reason that therefore Europe needs a strong defence uh, industrial base. And that will benefit Europe as credible allies to, to uh, the US within the lens of NATO. 
And that is not, I mean, that sort of competition is not a bad thing. I mean, actually, you just you know, need to look at the, the Airbus versus Boeing scenario in a, in a civil side, because that competition has led to both companies being better, both companies being stronger, and the products being better. So I think I mean, you know, there's a lot to be gained from Europe having the, 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 the commitment to build on what it does well. And we have incredible technology here. Sometimes we wonder, or we get slightly frustrated that, that people think you know, uh, innovation equals US. You know, it does not. We play and we go toe to toe with the Americans. We've got fantastic intellectual capability, fantastic intellectual property in the UK and Europe. And we need to build on that confidence. And do you think that the UK actually will fail in terms of its need to rearm um, fast enough and at sufficient scale and affordability if it doesn't team up? with European projects to benefit from those economies of scale? I don't think the UK is going to fail, but there are some profound implications that we need to, 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 to be aware of. I mean, you know, we've got great sovereign capabilities that we need to enhance and uh, nurture. I mean, those sovereign capabilities, of course, are in the nuclear arena, but they're also in space. They're also in satellites. They're in cryptography. And, you know, these are really, really important as, as, as part of the, the ISR uh, picture that, uh, that everybody has. So, I mean, you know, you've got that. But whatever we do, we need to work at this, you know, speed of relevance, as everybody says. And that means we need to be agile. And it's not just the primes. You know, we, as a company, we, we, we have 2,000, 3,000 companies, actually 2,900 companies, in our supply chain, of which 700 of those are SMEs. Now, we need to work really closely with the SMEs to encourage this agility. We can't do it all on our own. And, you know, actually, we don't want to do it on our own. But, but yes, we need demand signals. We need partnership. That underpins uh, what we do because we can't do it all together. And that partnership is across the supply chain and across borders. Um, Mark, um, I'd be very remiss if I didn't talk about the Defence Command paper refresh. Uh, which is the, um, the basically the mini defence review that ha is happening in the MOD after the integrated review refresh. And decisions are happening right now. Um, we've been told this paper will come out um, before the end of June. Um, and, and the Prime Minister this morning, uh, he did talk, you know, quite fondly it sounded, about how he's got a fifth generation aircraft, he's got carrier strike, he's investing in more nuclear submarines, he wants an army of 100,000 uh, full-time and reservists. But within main building, I'm sure you're hearing, as you know, those of us who follow defence are, um, the numbers don't add up. Um, there, is, uh, there seems to be uh, you know, a vast uh, uh, you know, a wish list of, of what people, what you know, commanders say they need in order to achieve the ambition set out in the integrated re review, but they are having to work under a, a pretty constrained financial envelope, especially over the next couple of years, given that this new £5 billion extra that was given is, one, well short of what the MOD asked for, and two, being sucked up mainly by the <coughs> nuclear enterprise. Uh, so if you were still in your previous job, uh, what would you be advising? Well, actually, so right at the beginning of the, the first integrated review, uh, and I, I was still there as we kicked that process off, I got the defence chiefs and um, uh, some of the top civil servants in defence together and said, right, what we're not going to do this time is allow fantasy efficiencies to be the balancing item. Because that's what had happened over several reviews. There was a long list of, um, uh, of, of capability commitments, um, headline commitments to the size of the army, the number of aircraft, the number of frigates, all of that kind of thing, um, without the resources um, to, uh, uh, to, 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 de to um, develop and deploy those effectively. And the result was cuts, to, it's called suppression, a rather elegant word. What it means is cuts to training, to equipment, to ordnance. And so it means that we have um, uh, yeah, over 100 aircraft of a particular type, but only ordnance for a couple of dozen of them uh, uh, over a few days, to go to Peter's earlier point about the use of ordnance in, uh, in conflict. We have uh, an under-trained uh, and under-exercised uh, army. 
uh, we have um, frigates, um, uh, an entire class of frigates, nearly all of which were under maintenance at one point. Uh, and so what we agreed um, among the, you know, the military chiefs uh, uh, and the professionals, if you like, was we would go to ministers and say, for whatever level of resources you are prepared to commit, this is what we think we need, uh, and this is, the, this, is, this is, if you like, the first rate, the world-class capability we can provide at whatever scale, rather than committing to larger numbers, but in effect, therefore, having them fundamentally second rate because they weren't, they weren't um, over time, at least, because capability was being eroded. And the truth is, if we go to two and a quarter, two and a half percent uh, of GDP in defence, nearly all of that will be used up dealing with some of the things John Healy was talking about earlier, you know, dealing with military housing, um, dealing with building the latent capability in the defence supply chain that we need to be able to scale up. As Peter says, you don't want, you don't want to have stockpiles rusting. You want to be able to scale up um, supply quickly, but that costs uh, money. Uh, ensuring that people are fully trained, that they're able to go on exercise, that the ships are properly maintained, that we have enough ordnance uh, available for a, uh, for, a, for a crisis and so on. That'll all be gone at 2.5%. 2.5% is not going to buy us a bigger army uh, or, uh, or larger numbers. And we have to be honest with ourselves that there is a difference between inventory and capability. Um, and what we should be doing at whatever level of resources the country can afford, aiming for a capability that is absolutely first rate at whatever scale uh, we, can, uh, we can commit to. And that's what I would be advising. And what, would that, what would that look like then? Well, it would, it would probably look like the sort of numbers that we're hearing about um, already. So, you know, yeah, of course, I'd like, to see, you know, I'd like to see us have a bigger army. I'd like to see us have uh, more capability. But that is going to cost money. And if, and if, you know, if we're prepared to go to 3% of GDP on defence, or as I've argued, 4% of GDP on national security, which would kind of be about 3 on defence, about 07 on development, the rest going on intelligence, diplomacy, and all the other things, but actually flexing within a national security budget because you've got to deal with new threats, cyber, uh, and all the rest of it. If we were willing to do that, then, of course, we'd be able to build more capacity as well as capability. But if we decide we can afford 2 and a quarter, 2.5% of GDP uh, on, uh, uh, on defence, then what we should be doing is saying, right, what is the, uh, what is the absolute world-class version of each element of our force package uh, as part of NATO, that we can deliver for that. And if that means an army of 70,000 rather than an army of 100,000, I'd rather have a 70,000 army that's fully trained, properly equipped, ready to go, uh, able to deploy, than one of 100,000 that actually has its training budget cut and has substandard housing and morale problems uh, uh, and all the rest of it. I'd rather have a 100,000 army that could do all of that too, but that's going to cost more money. And that's what we should be doing as professionals. Ruth, what do you think, um, looking at the US a bit on this, what do you think the US is thinking when it looks to its European allies, it looks to the NATO summit, it looks at what's being offered? Um, do you think that it will regard, it will look at Europe as stepping up in a way that not just the previous president, Donald Trump, had demanded, um, but that all presidents have, to, to, to a relative extent, wanted Europe to do more in terms of being able to defend itself and not just be this um, sort of drain on US military resource? So, I mean, I, I think two things. Firstly, I, I think it depends who, who we're talking about in the US, because clearly there are sections of the US um, kind of political elite who are never going to be convinced. Um, I think the, the second issue is, is which part of Europe, and I think it's, you know, one of the things that's become clear in the last few years and has become particularly clear um, you know, since, since February last year is that Europe is not a single institution in, in this regard, that, that different states have different levels of commitment and clearly the, you know, the, the Biden administration is aware of this, the Trump administration was aware of this, um, you know, they, they almost the only kind of positive things they ever had to say about Europe were really about Poland um, you know, and, and Polish levels of commitment. Um, so there's, yeah, I mean, I'm sure there is a continuing kind of dissatisfaction with some levels of, of defence spending um, across the European members of NATO. Um, to the extent that the war has changed that, I'm sure that's welcome, but clearly it hasn't changed it very much in the case of some states. Um, and that's going to continue to be an irritant. And, and obviously, you know, if there is 
particularly if there is a, a change for administration after 2024, that is, um, that's going to be a very difficult issue for NATO, I think. Um, you know, if we have a return to President Trump or somebody like President Trump um, making a continuing case for US engagement in NATO, particularly at the levels that they have done so far, I think it's going to be much harder. Um, Thank you. I um, realise I've run out of time for my question. So if someone, if people in the audience have questions, please put your hand up. Um, the gentleman at the back with his hand uh, just there. Is there? Yes. Yes, yes. Oh, yeah. Min Campbell, sorry. Oh. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I'm a member of the United Kingdom delegation to the NATO Parliamentary Assembly, which prompts my question. Uh, when we heard that Sweden and Finland wanted to join NATO, there was a universal welcome. Would uh, any of the panel pe uh, be willing to comment on the continuing obstacle in relation to Sweden to full membership of NATO caused by the attitude of Turkey. Who would like that one? Peter? Well, all I would note is I think the second round of the Turkish presidential election is on the 28th of May. Um, so pretty much regardless of who wins, there might be time to straighten up this situation by the time of the Vilnius summit. And personally, I know it wasn't on the, uh, the president's wish list for the summit, I think confirming Sweden as a member of the alliance would be one of the best things that could come out of that su summit. Yeah, it is positive noises from the British, really, I think, <laughs> on that question. Um, Thank you. <laughs> um, the gentleman here at the, at the front. Thanks. David Liddington, Chairman of RUSI. Um, can I to push further on the question about United States policy? I mean, how seriously do the panel rate the chances of a future president or Congress in the future significantly weakening the US commitment to the security of Europe, given isolationism and the priority of the Indo-Pacific? And what should the European allies do to try to mitigate that risk, and perhaps in particular, would it help or would it be dangerous to uh, talk about creating a European pillar of the Atlantic Alliance that was capable of acting without the United States leadership, if necessary? So, um, obviously, I have views, I'm sure others do as well. But um, I, I think it's something that we need to be concerned about. Um, I personally would be surprised if even a second administration um, of President Trump saw a significant withdrawal um, by the US from NATO. And one of the reasons for that is that um, on NATO and indeed on Russia and on Ukraine, um, Trump is still an outlier in his own party. Now that's changing. Um, but it would require, I think, um, agreement in a majority Republican Congress, both houses and the presidency. And that's not something that historically happens very often, even when you have a majority um, in Congress that, that is of the same party as the president. Um, it's actually quite difficult to get Congress to agree to anything, particularly anything that significant. Um, and we saw that um, by way of example when a Republican majority, House of Representatives and Senate in, I think, 2018, actually can pass legislation to stop Trump uh, rolling back sanctions against Russia and passed it by a huge majority. So even people who had come in, you know, been elected at the same time as Trump, um, were voting uh, to, to block the president on that. So I, 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 uh, this is not, this is not um, a council for complacency. Um, I do think uh, certain states in particular need to send a much clearer signal that they have heard American long-standing complaints and they are going to step up and do something about it. Um, but I would be surprised. Um, I would be very surprised if, if the US withdraws from NATO already scales down. I think the big, to me, the big danger is um, anxiety about that and European states um, anticipating it and potentially moving away in various ways from NATO and, and forming additional um, security relationships. And that, I think, then it becomes very difficult. Um, a whole range of things become difficult, including deterrence, I think. 
Mark, you want to say something? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, three points, and David, you and I have talked about this before. Um, I think, first, let's not, as, as Ruth has just indicated, uh, President Trump made this vivid, but um, this concern in the United States that the, uh, Europe is not doing enough for its own defence predates him. Uh, and actually, one of the most alliance-friendly defence secretaries, actually Trump's first defence secretary, Jim Mattis, said we can't care more about your own security than, than you do. Uh, and the, the American Pacific tilt began under President Obama. So I think there's a real trend. Isolationism and certainly the Pacific focus is a real trend uh, in American politics. Um, and it isn't, it isn't the case we should only worry about a formal um, American position to... Um, uh, 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 dilute the commitment to NATO. It's just that actually changing resources and moving troops around um, and talking uh, as they are at the moment or as some of the Republicans are at the moment about winding down support for Ukraine and imposing a peace deal within 24 hours. All of that has an immediate effect. Um, what can Europe do about it? Well, the best way to keep the Americans in is to do more ourselves. I mean, that is quite clear. Uh, and that doesn't just mean everybody spending more, it means spending it more effectively and, as you've indicated, David, doing so in a way that actually creates integrated capability um, rather than uh, 28 or 29 separate mini um, full-spectrum you know, full forces. So we need to really think, um, as, uh, as the European um, pillar of NATO, and, I, and by that I mean European, not the EU, although there's obviously a big overlap, but the European pillar of NATO, of how do we collectively create capability? And too often the discussion in this country is what are we going to do? How big is our army going to be? How big is our, uh, our, our forces going to be wherever they might be deployed? And actually in this theatre, it's what is NATO need and what are we going to contribute uh, to that? And uh, recognise that burden sharing means that not everyone is going to do a bit of everything, that actually if Poland is going to be, build the biggest army in Western Europe, well then they can do that and we'll do, you know, we may be able to do other um, uh, other things. And on the whole question of the, of the politics of this, um, in the end, the biggest threat to our national security in this theatre is lack of European capability. It's not too much. Uh, and if politically European, our, our continental neighbours, or many of them, need to stick an EU flag on it in order to be able to win the argument with their own publics, well, let's figure out a way of letting them do that. And diplomats and, and ministers you can, I think, find a way somehow of navigating the EU-NATO relationship so that uh, if that's what they need to build more capability, it's, it's part of supporting NATO rather than turning into something competitive with it. What Ukraine has demonstrated is you know, the ideas that somehow or other there's going to be an alternative to NATO are nuts. And, uh, and anything any European does to encourage that is, is really damaging. So I think we should just relax a bit about that and allow everyone to manage their own politics and put, put whatever flag they want on it, as long as it's available to NATO. Jeremy, you wanted to come in. Yeah, can I just follow up on something that, that uh, Mark just said about, you know, s spending the, the defence pound, as it were, or euro more effectively? I mean, surely a way to, to make the most of this is in cooperation. And, I mean, actually, if, if you're going to make cooperation partnering, I mean, let's call it partnering. You need critical mass. You need budgets. And everybody needs to, you know, put the budget in somewhere, be it a, a company or a country. That means you then share the R&D to make sure that uh, you get the quality, the technology of the project. If you share the R&D, it's that much better. Underpinning all of this is, of course, you know, the fact that we still need to be competitive. We still need to make, as you were saying, the best products uh, we can in the world. But if we do that, and we've got numerous examples of success, that then leads to export success. And exports then offset that defence pound and that investment even further. So it's a virtuous circle cooperating you know, uh, with our allies. And I think and, you know, we in Europe are pretty good at that. I'll just add one point very quickly. I mean, Heather mentioned it, Heather Williams, first thing this morning. Increasingly, the talk in Washington is about the two-peer problem. And that, that discussion is going to go on. And I think it means, inevitably, that in 10, 15 years' time, if we're still in this confrontation with Russia, then a greater burden of deterring Russia is going to fall on the Europeans. Yeah, 
Yeah, and actually, given that you've all spoken, I'll speak to you. Um, I thought a little interesting vignette from the Madrid summit last year, the NATO summit, was that obviously, you know, in the, we, the, the, the full-scale war in, in Ukraine was raging, or is still raging, but was really quite fresh then. And it was absolutely the burning issue on the agenda for all the European allies. Um, but it was very notable that when President Biden, obviously the US president is the, the big person in the room when it comes to NATO, um, when he gave his end of summit press conference, the two issues that he wanted to focus on were, first of all, domestic, road versus way. They just had the announcement about abortion. And the second, about China. Um, and there was a real division and a real sense within NATO about the relative balance that needs to be focused on China versus Russia. Uh, and that is also an area of division. There's a gentleman right at the back who's been very patient, uh, waving his hand around now. Thank you, Mr. the Bureau's Ambassador of Lithuania. I probably might still continue to, cha to, to, to question you on the Vilnius Summit. Uh, uh, in Madrid, uh, the decision, you, you mentioned Madrid, the, in Madrid last year, the decision was that when and, and, and where is necessary, NATO will increase uh, substantially the presence in the, in the eastern flank. So we believe uh, Vilnius, uh, in Vilnius, but probably not only in Vilnius, that time is ripe to increase. So how do you feel, if, if, from your perspective, should we increase substantially NATO presence in the eastern flank in order to protect NATO from the east? Thank you. Um, I, I can go first. Yes, is the short answer. And it goes to the earlier point when Campbell was asking about, about the accession of Sweden and Finland. These are two really serious military powers. Uh, it's going to double NATO's border. Finland's accession will double NATO's border with Russia. And if you include Belarus, even if you include Belarus, it's, it's an extra third. Uh, and part of what we need to do in the northern flank, so north of, uh, north of you, is hold significant Russian forces at risk in order that, by deploying forward elsewhere, um, we can uh, deter, uh, deter Russian adventurism uh, elsewhere. So we need to use that addition to NATO's capability in the north in order to um, put further pressure uh, on Russia uh, across their entire uh, flank. And I think... One of, the, uh, uh, one of the, the best innovations um, over the past few years was the Joint Expeditionary Force, which brings together the Nordic and Baltic nations and the UK in a genuinely integrated capability, where, everyone, where forces are not all trying to do a bit of everything, but actually are bringing um, uh, different capabilities together into, into something that is greater, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And that's the kind of model we should be applying elsewhere in NATO. Peter. I, I agree with that. I would just say that I don't think we should get too hung up about, you know, brigades or whatever. I mean, what we should be looking at is ways of making enhanced forward presence more resilient, yeah. tougher, harder, which means looking at its logistics and all of those things, you know, the, the boring but necessary stuff that doesn't get enough attention. We should also be looking at how we can best reinforce in a crisis. And I'm rather hoping that at some point the UK will be admitted to the PESCO Military Mobility Project, because I think that will make a big contribution to that. Thank you. Um, we're almost out of time, and there are still quite a few questions. So yeah, there's there's a one, gentleman right at the back there with his hand up. Why don't you take a couple? David Richards as well. David wants to get um, And then if we could just also take, we'll just take three if that's OK, and then you can pick and choose, because then we'll be out of time. So David Richards there. And then George over there. Peter Wilson Smith from Meritus Consultants. The Polish president talked about the role Poland could play in engaging with Africa. Um, I mean, one of the striking and depressing things about the Ukraine war is that we in the West have lost the global South. I mean, only about 40 countries have imposed sanctions against Russia. You talk to people in Africa and they say the West is is hypocritical, what they draw comparisons with us marching into Iraq and so on. And they may not be explicitly supporting Russia, but they're not supporting Western policy in Ukraine against Russia. How much does this matter to European security? What's gone wrong and what should we do about it? Okay, thank you. Um, David? Um, I was told I was only, only allowed one question a day, so but I'm going to go for another. Um, I'm not a great fan of the integrated review or the refresh. 
um, in large part because it did not come to terms with the UK's straightened economic circumstances. And the strategy that's undeliverable or unachievable is very dangerous. What worries me today is that our armed forces, not in good nick, I can absolutely reinforce what the panel have said, although I think it's even worse than perhaps Peter Watkins believes. Um, but we're spread all over the place. So it's impossible as a, uh, as a chief of defense or whoever one's talking about is doing all this planning to, to be able to do anything properly. I'd like to ask the panel whether we should not now go back, as I think we should have done, and allow the UK to focus on NATO and the Euro-Atlantic uh, and the armed forces focus on that area and doing our bit properly within NATO and in the context of the war in Ukraine, rather than being diverted to take part in wars against China or whatever it is that they're uh, speculating about, allowing in the process, and this is a key, American forces to focus on China on our collective behalf, while we all do much more in Europe. And last question from George. Uh, George Brandis, uh, National Security College in Australia. I want to go back, ask the panel to go back to the question of what victory looks like in Ukraine. President Zelensky has understandably been very steadfast in saying it means uh, every Russian boot off Ukrainian soil. Let it be assumed that the um, summer offensive is a, or counter offensive is effective, that, um, that the Russian troops are repelled and ultimately, whenever, driven from eastern and northern Ukraine, but not from Crimea. There are different issues, including historical issues and military issues, concerning Crimea. I'd be interested in knowing the panel's thoughts about whether, on that scenario, there might be a weakening of the will, at least among the Europeans or indeed the Americans, uh, when it comes to declaring a victory. Thank you. So three big questions, three short answers, please. Uh, running out of time. Who wants to do Global South? Anyone? 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 Peter, thank you. <clears throat> well, I do think it's important. Um, and I think, um, and possibly an earlier speaker did this, we take a bit too much false comfort from the fact that those UN General Assembly voting figures haven't moved very much, um, because a lot of countries are sitting on the fence. Um, and I think there is more that we could be doing um, to persuade those countries that what Russia has done is basically wrong. I mean, People use the term the rules-based international system, which is seen as a Western construct, and therefore the, um, the Global South aren't very um, uh, sympathetic to it. But actually, the Ru Russia's war contravened the basic principles of the UN Charter. And that has been set out very well. It was a lecture at another place on this, in this part of, uh, of London uh, by Roy Allison. And I, I think that message needs to be reinforced much more strongly than it has been. Ruth, don't you take that question from David Richards about whether the integrated review has got it wrong? No, you don't. Like, no, no, I would prefer to answer the last question. You don't, okay, you ask, okay, Mark, <laughs> so can you do the integrated review? Have they got it wrong? Should we actually ditch Indo-Pacific for America to deal with? And we'll just focus all our effort on NATO Atlantic security. It's an attractive, it's an attractive argument, and I, I, I have a lot of sympathy with it. But David, look, you, know, you and I both made our reputations in expeditionary campaigns. Um, you, you know, over several, and me over a couple. And the truth is that if you're dealing with national security priorities, you don't really get to choose what comes at you. Uh, and so the next great crisis might be in the Indo-Pacific, or it might be something else that blows up somewhere to Europe, South and East, and we have to get back into an expeditionary effort of some kind because circumstances force that. And we like to think we can determine which threat we're going to face, and I think it's, I think it's too tempting. My own view is that the, 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 the USP, if you like, of the British Armed Forces is to be able to be deployable flexibly. And I think you know, having, if you like, expeditionary type capabilities that can be used in the European or the Euro-Atlantic theater is probably something, probably only the UK, maybe France, but, but, but uh, of the European nations, the UK can probably do better than anyone. And that means that you know, we aren't just recreating the British Army, the Rhine, et cetera, and having people sitting around um, waiting for the threat from Russia. Um, 
we can deploy those forces out of area if necessary, if there are other crises, but they need to be capable, of course, of being deployed back into the Euro-Atlantic area at the disposal of SACA if necessary. And that's something I say no other European nation can really quite do to the same extent. So that's the sort of approach I'd take to the defence side. And I think if you broaden it out, then um, uh, I don't think it has to be a binary, uh, a binary choice. I, was, I thought after you spoke and George was coming, I thought we might get the counterpoint on the AUKUS, uh, 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 on the AUKUS, uh, on the AUKUS deal. Because that's about defence capability um, uh, as much as it's about, uh, and defence industrial capability, as much as it's about operational uh, deployment. We've acceded to the Trans-Pacific uh, Trade Agreement. Um, uh, uh, there, are, there are lots of other elements to our national security and national capabilities that we could can deploy into the Indo-Pacific, fastest growth areas in the world, which doesn't necessarily mean skewing our defence around. I just think we, need, we, can, we can take a smart approach to it. I absolutely agree on the Global South point, by the way. Um, can you agree that quickly? Is, yeah, that is fundamentally about China. And, and we need to, the West needs to re-engage in the Global South with respect, recognising they are not going to, uh, uh, they're not going to make a binary choice. They've rediscovered the appeal of non-alignment. It is in their interests to do so. And we need to recognise that reality and be a lot smarter and a lot more engaged about it. But it's fundamentally about China, not about Russia. So Ruth, what does victory look like in Ukraine? Well, I, I mean... In I, about a minute. <laughs> I, I certainly think um, it is much less the case than it was at the start of the war that Crimea is treated differently. Um, I think, you know, in the early weeks and months of the war, there was a perception, certainly I encountered it, um, among policymakers across Europe, actually, um, that Crimea was, was a separate case somehow. And I think that's eroded. Um, and I think one of the reasons that it's eroded, um, well, uh, partly because it, it is clear that, um, that Ukraine has uh, much greater kind of military effectiveness than was expected at the beginning, uh, partly because Russia um, has not stepped up, um, you know, when its red lines have been crossed in the way it's threatened to do. Um, all of which create the conditions for, for thinking about Crimea. Um, but I think for all of us, not just for Ukraine, I think for all of us actually, um, victory does look like um, Ukraine going back to its legally recognised 1991 borders. And one of the reasons for that, very importantly for all the rest of us, is that as long, I think as long as Russia is in Crimea, it continues to pose a significant threat to the Black Sea region as a whole, which means it continues to pose a significant security threat to NATO. Um, you know, but there has been a lot of talk since the start of the war amongst you know, people like John Mearsheimer um, and, and others that you know, the, the cause of the invasion, entirely incorrectly, that the cause of the invasion was a NATO expansion. Actually, the great permissive cause of this war uh, was that Russia was allowed in a 1997 agreement with Ukraine to carry on basing the Black Sea Fleet in Crimea. And that was what created the, the possibility uh, for the war as it's unfolded. It was what created the, the annexation of Crimea in 2014. As long as Russia is in Crimea, it is going to be a threat to Ukrainian security, but to European security in all sorts of ways. Um, so I think, for me at least, uh, that's what victory looks like. Hey, well, I want to hope you would join me in thanking the panellists for a really excellent discussion. <laughs> Three minutes over time, but we did start a little bit late, so I actually think I kept within my hour. Um, <laughs> and this is the end of day one of the London Defence Conference, and I hope you'll all be back again for day two, when, amongst <laughs> many sparkling more panels, we also have the Swedish Defence Minister and other speakers for you. So, thank you.